Hey, hey, Shug, what's up, man? Whoa, there we go, turn that down. How's everyone doing tonight? What's up, Shug? You should be studying for your essay. I, hey, I agree. I need to be studying too. I'm signed up for, I'm signed up for all three associates because I need to renew mine. Um, I got to start studying and then I'm going to try to get my professionals pretty soon. Uh, probably in like, maybe like June, May, May or June. I'm going to try to get my, uh, my pros, but, uh, hope everyone's doing well tonight. We might get, um, I have my, my pup is in here behind me, um, and she's pretty protective behind glass. So she, uh, when people walk past, she might bark. So we might get a little bit of uh, interruptions, um, or you might see her walking around and pacing around. So um, if that happens, let me know. I mean, well, if that happens, no big deal. Um, we'll just, I'll calm her down. We'll take a little break. Um, but how is everyone doing tonight? Um, also, uh, people have asked me about updates on uh, updates on her because I, I let people know she um, she was in here last time. She had a cone around her neck because she had to get a biopsy. So bad news, she does uh, she does have cancer, which is which is common in large breed dogs like this, especially about this age. But the good news is that it's actually uh, I, I didn't know you could have different grades of cancer. She has low grade cancer, um, and it hasn't spread. It hasn't metastasized or something. So there may be some options to um to to you know to completely remove it or um the, the situation isn't as dire as they thought it was originally um they were kind of telling us like three to six months and all this other stuff so we're in a we're, we're in a much better place so silver line in there uh since a couple people had asked about that <laughs> preemptibles on gcp I, I i i need to get i need to get deeper into gcp i only have messed like i've messed with gcp recently to because to, because i think they're people have told me their kubernetes service is good eks is good not eks um gks is good um so i mean i tried that out a bit um but i didn't do some more work in there we just had a lot of jobs running and printing those through kubernetes wow that sucks that does suck um that sucks a lot all right, tonight should be tonight should be short. Actually, tonight won't be like all the other nights. This will be one of our shorter ones. Um, tonight we are covering networking and security, and let's hop into our um, syllabus, our curriculum. So, uh, also I need to update this because it's not curriculums; it's curriculi, I believe. Um, but I thought that would confuse people. But I'm going to go back and make it right because we care about being proper around here around these parts we are very proper uh but tonight is networking and security so we did a we did some fun stuff with some bash scripting we did a bash scripting lab tonight we're going to learn a, a little bit more about how kind of um I, what, this stuff is what i really think uh your job all kind of set, like the job of a devops engineer anyone trying to deploy software uh for people to use around the world over the web um this these are kind of some of the major concepts that all of it revolves around so tonight's gonna be pretty important this is kind of be foundational knowledge to what you uh, to what you're learning. So we're gonna go over OSI model, DNS, uh, HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SSL, TLS, and SSH, SCP. Um, we'll, we'll be able to see some of these in action, but a lot of it is, uh, is information. Some of it you might have to go further on and, and learn, but we'll, we'll, we'll move some files around. We'll check out some protocols and, uh, maybe you'll learn a few new commands tonight, but tonight should be, we should be able to finish in the two hour mark. No problem, which I like. I like the two hour, uh, <laughs> I like the two hour streams. Um, and I, think, I actually think next time around, just so there's enough time, um, I'm actually modifying this course substantially right now. Um, and it'll either be more times per week or it will be longer classes, probably more times per week uh, because I don't get to do as much as I think is needed for this course. Um, so just keep an eye out for that if you wanna do more. It's gonna be more advanced as well if we do more days per week. So cool. Yes. Curricula, curricula. Yes. Um, so I did learn that. Um, I actually, <laughs> it's funny. I actually only, the only reason I knew that is because I typed it into, uh, I typed it in somewhere and it was showing me that it was spelled wrong and it wasn't giving me an option to correct it. And so I went to go Google it and that's how I learned. Um, again, this is a, this is a technical engineering, uh, training thing. Not so much an English training thing but we are always learning, always ready to learn. 
Um, okay, let's, um, the slides should be available. I dropped the slides late. Um, so <laughs> I'm learning my lesson to, I guess as a DevOps engineer, like I kind of want to automate things as much as possible. So I tried to automate a whole bunch of stuff uh, with things that I wasn't quite familiar with, like in like the Google Classroom um, and some other stuff. Like I'm realizing I'm having problems with those things because I tried to like, I tried to make it too easy on myself before like learning how to just use it uh, as a tool. So yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna learn how to use these things as a tool first. Not really hard, but um, then it'll help me automate those things a little bit better. It's a really annoying uh, song name. Um, song name is I Wish It Would Never Stop Snowing by Sleepy Fish. Let me get you the link right now. Copy song link. Let's paste that into. Where is it? There you go. I can give you the I'll give you the link to the entire playlist as well. If you're if anyone's interested, it's a Spotify link. So hopefully you like Spotify. Sorry for all my Apple music people. Cool. Yeah, I'm probably going to get a little panel that'll give that information as well. So I don't have to so people can just get it on their own. Uh, all right. All right. All right. Do you have a button that makes you coffee? Uh, no. I don't, I don't think so. Um, cool. Let's get started. Let's pull up the sweet slides tonight. Tonight is a little, little slide heavy. Um, again, cause these are more conceptual. Um, again, we, we can get hands on with a few of them, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be learning some new commands and stuff tonight, but a little bit boring. So actually we'll wait three more minutes again. Cause whenever I, whenever it's not going to be a full two hours, give people a little bit of time to get comfortable, hop in and, you know, sit down get some food. Um, tonight we're going with the lime LaCroix that we didn't drink last night, uh, for hydration and, uh, yeah, purely for hydration purposes. Makes me feel like I'm drinking a soda, even though it's not very, it's not very good. And it's not super cold, which I don't really like that much. Um, different zeros that bad. All right, so let's do this networking. Actually, nope. I just lied to you. I just said we we're gonna wait till eight ten. Um. Oh wait, I have a I have a really big announcement. Um. Well, that's not that big of one. I I already sized it. T let me take that back. Calm it down a little bit. Um. Sat Sunday. This upcoming Sunday is the Super Bowl. Um, so um, pe people, I, I should have taken that into account with scheduling. Um, people was like, hey, like, are you really gonna stream during Super Bowl? Um, so what we're gonna do instead is we are going to still stream on Sunday. We're gonna stream at noon Eastern time on Sunday. This up this upcoming Sunday, it's gonna go, um, I'm, it's gonna be on the site as well. I'm gonna tweet it out. I'm gonna put it on social media, but it's going to be at noon. Um, so anyone who likes this schedule, who wants to stick around and watch it during this time, you'll be able to easily replay it back, um, on Twitch, uh, whenever you like after that, but we're going to, so noon Eastern time is when we're going to stream it so that everyone can spend time with their families. Um, you know, like that's, that's a time of, of, uh, of friendship and family. Um, and I don't want to take that from people. Um, so that is what we are going to do. Uh, then yeah, what are we covering that day? We are covering, I think that's a lab day to be honest, which kind of sucks. Cause last time we had to move, um, yep. Sure. As it is a checkpoint lab, you know, what we'll do, um, we will, hmm, 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 hmm. I want to see if we can switch something, but yeah, now it'll have to be, it'll have to be this checkpoint lab day. Um, again, you'll just have to follow. If you can't make it, um, I know people on the West coast, sorry, that's super early for you. Um, I will make sure to have a, uh, while we're going through this, I'll make sure to have, um, instructions and GitHub for people to pull down, um, so that you can kind of run through yourself, but you can also run through the video and watch it as well. But yeah, we'll do it at noon. Um, and again, I'll, I'll harp it. Uh, for the rest of the, for the rain of the week. So anyone who is not around right now, we'll definitely get that information. Um, sorry for the inconvenience. Next time I will, uh, learn experiences. I will keep that in mind when I'm scheduling these things out. Um, cool. And I don't think there's any more like holidays or any big, huge events, um, that we need to kind of address for and adjust for, 
Um, after that, uh, maybe uh, what is what is Valentine's Day? Maybe Valentine's Day, but I doubt it. Uh, I think we're good on that time. So I think we'll, I think we're good there. Cool. Eight ten, perfect timing. Um, perfect timing. Let's get on with it. Networking and security. Your network is your net worth. Um, while that's true, um, I couldn't think of anything. I couldn't think of a cool way to add security in there. These taglines are always going to be dumb. Uh, I literally write the title and then I immediately think of the first thing that comes to mind and I stick it in here and it usually works out. Sometimes it doesn't like today. All right. The first thing we are going to cover tonight is um, something that I have a love hate relationship with. Um, it's something that's becoming it's, it's very, very important, um, but it's something that's becoming less and less uh, needed for the type of work that is being done. A lot of things are being abstracted away, so you don't necessarily need to be super keen on this, um, but it's, it's important to, um, you know, as we're running through this stuff, uh, be familiar with it. Uh, definitely take some time to just look over it and, and have some familiarity with it. You know, like I've been in interviews, I've been asked about this uh, recently. Um, but yeah, the OSI model, you hear it a lot. Um, you'll, you'll hear it a lot in regards to, especially if you're doing, um, if, if you're about to do or interviewing for a job that's uh, more OPSI, um, so more, uh, you know, systems administrator, systems engineering, you're going to be really managing uh, servers and things like that. Uh, you might get questions like this in your interview. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is important to know. Um, it's important to know, but like, don't kill yourself if you don't memorize it, but try, definitely try. So OSI model has seven layers. Remember that's the first thing you need to remember. Concepts are big. Seven layers, writing the number seven down, seven layers. And we're going to start from the bottom on this list. Uh, the bottom is number one. Uh, hey, Fitzhawk, thank you for the subscription. Welcome to the family. But we're starting at the bottom of the model. So down here, we've got the physical layer. So layer one, what does that mean? This is your physical infrastructure. This is your uh, your your bare metal, your machines, your wires. So physical in infrastructure, your coaxial cable, your fiber, uh, wireless hubs uh, and repeaters. Uh, this is all of that. Um, um, this is this is all those things. So OSI model um, actually stands for, and I <laughs> I got this wrong last time because again it's something that um, no one asks you about anymore, um, and I should have put it on here. But it is the open systems interconnection model. So it is a networking model. Um, I'm surprised no one asked that already. How do I control plus plus this? Control plus plus, but a little bit bigger, but it's the open systems interconnection model and it's a conceptual model that characterizes and standardizes the communication functions of a telecommunication or computing system. So it's a networking model um, and that is what the OSI model is. And again, it's a conceptual model. Um, so physical layer one, this is again, your machines, your systems, your, your, your wires, the actual things you can touch, feel, plug in, all that stuff. All right, the next level up is your data link layer. This is level two of the OSI model. Level one physical, level two data link. This is the thing that uh, links um, the data together. It's a data link. It allows um, data to be transferred. Uh, so things like ethernet and, and switches and bridges um, is your level two of the OSI model. So um, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep going higher, but just as we're going through this, start to think about the category of things we're talking about. Um, and and one of the reasons why it's in, it's important to not necessarily memorize which layer is what and the transport layer is level four and applications level level, uh, level seven. That's not so much the, that's not so much the, you, you should do that, but the, the thing you really want to pull out of it is kind of the the role each of the levels plays, um, because then you can start to find out uh, where issues it's easier to find out where issues lie um, and kind of pinpoint um, how you can tackle them by figuring out, you know, what layer um, is this thing really operating in? What layers is problem happening in? What layer do I need to? Um, adjust or or change or add to to get functionality that I need. And so again, the the like, just keep in mind uh, kind of what we have here in the groupings of this. So data link, um, very um, very it's it's 
pretty closely related to the to the network layer. So these are things like packets. We're gonna learn about packets tonight and IP and ICMP protocols and your IP security and IGMP. There's all these protocols and there's these uh, there's these ways to, um, these are the actual linkages to um, the linkages and the, and the pathways for data to move around. Um, your network uh, layer is more of the protocols and the, the methods in which those things uh, get, get moved around in. Um, so we have that. So we have those first three physical data link network. And so uh, it's almost kind of a hierarchy as well. So kind of think from the physical, the just the box that you have, you know, in the closet. Um, and then it kind of stems off from there to be the Ethernet and the switches and bridges that you have. And it goes up to, you know, what's running through those things, what's running through those uh, those Ethernet cables and the switches and bridges and how is the data like moving through those things. Um, and then we get up into transport layer. Uh, so transport layer is your end to end connections. Um, and so that's, you know, from, from my system to your system, from wherever you're getting your data from, from google.com servers to your system, this is the transport layer and how data gets across it. So, um, the networking area is kind of the format in which it moves. Um, but the transport, uh, is, is, is the actual, um, the, the I don't even want to call it. The, it's, it's not the physical space that it that it uses to move, but it's the it's the full end to end swim lanes in which it uses to move, and in the uh, appropriate protocols. So in here we have TCP and UDP. We're gonna talk. Um, we're gonna talk about these a lot tonight. I mean not a lot, but we're gonna talk about TCP and UDP um, tonight, so that we can understand those um, and how data is really transported across networks. Um, then we have your session, uh, you have the session layer. So we have one, two, three, four, five, so up to the fifth layer. Level five is the session layer. Um, so it's funny because I, I feel like a lot of times, especially with the way that um, the kind of microservice architecture is kind of set up now, the way we kind of have things set up now, people um, actually, I, I see a lot of people getting um, issues with the application layer and the session layer, like mixed up, which is interesting. Um, but this is your, this is your, um, this is your, your sync and send ports, uh, API sockets, wind socks. Um, so these are your, these are the, these are the protocols. These are, this is the, the, the networking layer, um, which deals with these things like APIs. We're going to talk about APIs tonight. Um, that that allows for specific communication um, of 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 the session uh, per se. Um, so we'll put that in the context. I think that, I also think the session layer is the one that's hardest to. Um, I think it takes the most outside things to understand. It kind of it's it's like the it's like one of the things that you just don't see. Um, so it's kind of hard to put it into context. But we'll we'll definitely put the session layer into context tonight. Um, the presentation layer. So level six, um, is the syntax layer. Um, so these are some protocols that we're gonna talk about tonight. SSL, SS, uh, SSH, um, uh, the IMAP, FTP, MPEG, JPEG. This is a presentation layer. This is kind of giving you the information, presenting the information to you, presenting the data, uh, presenting the things that are coming over the network in various ways. Um, the presentation layer, um, handles that. And then the last layer we have at the top is this is going to be the one that, uh, you know, most software engineers are operating on, um, uh, that, that when issues are happening in the application layer, you're going to hear about these. Well, maybe hear about these first, but, um, this is the end user layer. So this is what the, this is kind of what the end user sees. This is the actual running application. Um, and so these are just some of the protocols that it incorporates uh, DNS. And you can see some of these, um, go over more than one layer. These are all just examples of tools and protocols that, uh, live over these. You can see like FTP and things are over here, HTTP. Um, but this is the end user layer, the actual running application. Um, and so, Again, you can use this OSI model to describe and to understand uh, where issues are happening and how to handle them uh, kind of on a networking layer, uh, really understanding this kind of networking hierarchy, this networking like flow map of of the way that networks, uh, the data moves through a network. So it's definitely learn it. Um, you probably won't, for the most part, you probably won't use it much in your day to day job. Like. I don't know. I've worked at a bunch of places and people aren't like, oh, like, oh, the issue's on layer seven, like the issue's on layer four. I don't hear that much. Maybe, maybe it's a regional thing. Maybe I just haven't worked at any jobs that did that. Um, but again, it, 
it's more important to understand uh, kind of these these groupings of functionality, these groupings of um, of I guess uh, uh, like technologies that um, that kind of express the way um, that a network works or that data moves through a network. Um, so yeah, so check out the OSI model. Uh, you can, if you just Google it, you'll get a million of these. Uh, you might get some better descriptions of what each layer is. Um, and you might need to read a few to really understand kind of what a layer does. You might need to get into a real project to kind of really understand as well. But again, just get, get a little familiar with it um, and it'll help you. It will help you in the future. All right. So we talked about networking. So everything, every like the way it, you wouldn't have a job as a DevOps engineer. DevOps doesn't exist kind of without the internet. The internet doesn't exist without uh, networking and these networking layers, the OSI model, these protocols, these things uh, that allow us to transfer data um, around the world for us to retrieve data from around the world. So um we learned a little bit about networking and how the, how those things work but now let's talk about how the internet works this is a big topic um it is a relatively simple topic to understand at first um but uh actually managing it and actually dealing with it it can become quite complicated actually um so let's talk about how dns works super important all right DNS, how the internet works. Uh, DNS stands for domain name system, but nobody says that everyone says DNS because everyone likes acronyms. Um, so why do we need this domain name system? Why is the internet built on this system? It's because web browsers interact through internet protocol addresses. So you've probably all heard of IP addresses. That is an internet protocol address and um, this is how this is how web browsers and computers uh, actually work. So, um, like w IP addresses are kind of like phone numbers. Um, having to memorize, you know, your what, what are they ten digit phone numbers? Um, IP addresses are kind of the same thing. They're they they are they're longer. Uh, they can be longer. They're not always longer. Um, but um, that is what you would have to do to memorize a site if you were going to interact with a site the same way uh, as as the computer likes to interact with it. You would have to remember this. Um, this maybe 12 digit number um, at, to, to know where to go with the site um, because that's how computers uh, operate. So we don't want to do that. That's gross. We don't have to want to remember that Google is 154.897.347.1 or something like we don't want to remember that. Um, so this is how we don't have to do that. So DNS translates domain names. So I think we all know what domain names are. You know, if you go to GoDaddy, you can purchase a domain name uh, and, you know, like mastermind.io or you can do aaronbrooks.dev. You can do your name.dev or uh, whatever, whatever you want, whatever's available. You can purchase that domain name. Um, and what DNS does is it translates that domain name into an IP address so that a computer knows uh, where to go. And the computer knows what the what the real location um, is for a website for a domain name. So super important, super important. Let me see. We're going to talk deep about it, but let me see if there is a, okay, before we get to DNS records, let's talk about the flow and you know what we're going to do because we have time, we're going to do a little draw.io thing here. We're going to, we're going to make a little diagram. <clears throat> then we made one. Uh, sure. Save it to Google Drive. Because everyone likes charts. I wanted to use an iPad for this, but I realized I want to use an iPad as a whiteboard for whenever I needed it. But I realized I had to purchase another little like uh like capture card. I already have two. I have one for the camera and one for the laptop. And I was like, I'm not spending another hundred and fifty dollars yet. So maybe one day we'll have a sweet whiteboard that is a an iPad. But uh, not right now. So we, even though we have this sweet model right here, um, we are going to we'll look at it, but then we'll draw. I think it's better if we create it ourselves. So um, if anyone doesn't know, Draw.io is a super cool application so that you can make different diagrams. Um, we are going to make. Uh, we're going to use this to make uh, it's commonly used to make architecture diagrams. Um, 
but a lot of different diagrams. So we're gonna use this to talk about DNS a little bit. So this is uh, Johnny and Johnny is at his computer. We'll get some cool things here. Johnny's at his computer and he wants to go to, um, he likes games. He wants to see the new review for the new Call of Duty game. All right. And he wants to go to IGN.com. What happens when he goes to IGN.com? He types in on his computer, he hits enter, what happens? The first thing that, uh, well, we're gonna talk about the high level thing and then we're gonna back it up and talk about what, um, what, what really happened. This is the first time, if this was the, we're gonna act as though this is the first time that he is ever going to IGN.com. Uh, so, what's gonna happen is, it's gonna go off uh, his request, is gonna get sent out over the internet. His, his computer is basically gonna say, hey, I don't know the IP address for IGN.com. I know this domain name. Let me see if I can go and get it. Um, and so the first request is gonna go to something called a recursive uh, name server. And how do I do some connecting here? Oh, that's not what I wanted. All right, so that's how the data is gonna flow. So you make the request. Uh, it, it says, hey, I don't know what the IP address is for that. I'm gonna reach out to these things called recursive name servers. And so on this diagram, it's here. Our diagram is gonna actually be different than this, but um, this is we're just gonna start right here. So um, sometimes um, it's possible, and it's, and it's likely, it's possible that this recursive name server will actually know, it'll have that record on there. It'll, it'll, um, it'll have these records uh, that you need for IGN.com on there, but let's say that it doesn't. Uh, what it will then do, this recursive name server will say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about, not something I, I have. So it's gonna go over to another server. It's gonna go over to the big daddy servers, uh, and these are called authoritative name servers. Now, there are tons of these recursive name servers. They're run by your uh, your internet service providers. There's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of these things out here. Um, but this right here, uh, this authoritative name server, authoritative, that's way off. That doesn't look right at all. Let's see. Yeah, see, that's why we, that's, that's, we don't even know how to spell when we have uh, computers. All right, let me make this a little bit bigger. We have these authoritative name servers now. Um, this is where uh, the, there's only, there's less than, there's less than 20, there's less than 20 of these. Um, now there are there are many more than 20 servers, but there are less than 20 um, authoritative uh, name server handlers or people who, uh, or, or companies who upkeep these authoritative name servers. And this is kind of the, again, authoritative place for to get the information uh, about what your domain name, what IP address your domain name is mapped to. Um, so there were, this will this will make a request over here, and this will have if it exists, if it's set up, if if this information, uh, if your domain name actually has an IP address assigned to it or or pointed at it, um, th it will have this information here, and so it gets the data from here. Then the data gets passed on back to you. Now I want to draw some arrows, but you can see here, um, you can see here the arrows kind of just going back. Uh, well, this this server like it like gets the information. Like I said, it probably already has it, but just kind of just trying to give you a high level flow of this data. Um, so you'll get the information basically passed back to you through here. Um, and so now your computer now has ends up with the IP address. Uh, so the data goes back through here. Goes like back to this computer, um, and so. You reached out with IGN.com. You said, hey, I'm looking for the IP address. I'm looking for the address for this. Um, and it gives it gives back um, some numbers. It gives back, you know, uh, let's put under here, it gives back. This is not a real IP address. I'm literally just throwing numbers down here. So don't sweat it. Oh, that's not right. All right, so you get, you get some numbers back and now your computer knows where to go. So actually, Let's put this here. Um, and so now that your computer knows where to go, your computer looking at this says, cool, I now know the address. So it's literally like you uh, not knowing where um, your friend lives, uh, what their address is. And you say, hey, you say, I want an I, 
I, Aaron, want to know where my friend Michael lives. I don't know where he lives, but I know that my friend Devin does. And I say, hey, Devin, what is Michael's address? So Michael's address is the equivalent of the domain name. And uh, my friend says he lives at 12345 Robin Lane. And that is the address I get passed back. So that's his his address is now translated into something I can use to actually find his house, find his location. So then using the IP address, your computer simply makes a request to uh, this networked IP address. Very, very simple. Out to some servers uh, where the website, whoa, undo, can you just delete, delete, delete. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna put website here. Hey, uh, Tram Stars, welcome, welcome to the channel. So right here is gonna be your website. All right, and then uh, the information is then just transmitted right back to you. Uh, the website data is now transmitted back to you. So this is essentially how DNS works. Seems pretty simple. Um, on the top, again, the high level idea of it is you're simply translating a domain name to an IP address so that your computer knows uh, where to go to get the data that it needs. And that in a nutshell is DNS for us. Um, I'm gonna share this in case anybody wants it. I don't know why anyone would want it, but everyone likes to have uh, resources. It's not, this is not a particularly good resource, um, but let's share this really quick. Now, um, now one thing um, that that is what happens if this is the full round trip if uh, if nothing's cached. But DNS can get real tricky because DNS uh, actually gets cached in a bunch of, bunch of different locations. What is caching? Caching is um, is basically stored saved data. So uh, it would it would be a lot of overhead if all the time your computer every time you want to go to Google the million times you go to Google a day, if your computer had to go find out what Google's IP address was. So what happens here is. Uh, uh, your computer actually usually caches uh, this locally. So if it gets back this IP address for IGN, it'll go ahead and it'll save this kind of in its local cache uh, so that next time you make the request to IGN, it'll say, uh, it'll, it'll check locally first. It'll say, hey, uh, in, my, in my DNS cache, in my DNS resolver locally, do I, do I know where uh, IGN.com goes? And it says, yep, we went there not that long ago. This is the IP address for it and it'll send you there. Um, same thing for the recursive name server. Um, it does th those cache a bunch of uh, of of mappings as well, um, and so that's great. But this is this is why DNS can be a huge problem. Um, what if a website changes its IP address? Um, that can be pretty tough. Um, so um, these caches uh, generally expire after a certain amount of time, um, but it can cause tons of issues if you still have the old information, but the site is posted at a new, uh, is, is now at a new IP address. It can be really, really problematic. Um, yeah, thanks for what you do. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Zufo. Thank you for the kind words. It's, it's pretty encouraging, actually. Thank you very much. Um, cool. So that is how DNS works. Pretty important. I promise you, uh, at some point in time, well, not I promise you, but it's 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 likely if you're trying to get a DevOps position, this is again, if it's especially if it's a more ops focus, you're doing more of like an SRE work. Um, you 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 may be asked this question, and being able to just explain that DNS translates uh, domain names into IP addresses is a really good thing to know, and to be able to it'll make you sound really good in an interview. Let's get back to here. So, um, how does like how do the those servers? How does the authoritative name server? Um, how does the the um, how does how does that stuff know? Um, what what the actual mappings are. Um, so these are with the DNS records. So <clears throat> when you purchase a domain, uh, once you own a domain, you have to set up, if you want people to be able to access your website, you have to you know tell these servers, you have to tell uh, people where they can get your site from, uh, what IP address your site is pointed at. So generally what you'll do is you will purchase a host name, uh, you will have your website, um, you will deploy it to a server. Um, let's say we use AWS or, or DigitalOcean. Um, that server will have an IP address um, associated with it. We will 
you know, put our code, put our website on the server. We will retrieve the IP address from our provider. Um, and then we will go into, um, we'll go into whatever, um, thing that we need to do. Um, you know, if it's GoDaddy, if it's Google domains or something, um, we will go, uh, and manage our DNS there. You can manage your DNS manually. Um, if you'd like, um, don't recommend it. Um, there are, you know, DNS is just a service that runs on machines. Um, and so there, there's all these zone files, all kinds of stuff to manage it manually, but you don't really need to do that nowadays. Um, to be hundred percent honest, well, you'll go into there, you'll go, they have a dashboard for you and you tell, you tell the internet where to go get your stuff from. So, uh, the main record, the, the, the main record that does this is an a record. Um, so a record is a host record. Um, and it operates over IPv4. So this is uh, IP Internet Protocol version four. This is your four octets of numbers here. So uh, this is like Google.com's like resolver 8.8.8.8. Um, but uh, this is a format of IPv4. Um, yeah, so this is kind of, it's becoming antiquated, um, but this is the IP address you're most gonna be used to. Um, and each of these, again, octets have three different, uh, three up to three numbers in them, uh, but they only have to have one. Um, so that is the main record that you're gonna use to point people at your site. Usually if you, you know, just are hosting something off of a server. Then we have uh, quadruple A records, which is another host record. This is a host record that is designed to work with IP version six, so IPv6. So uh, we're actually running out of IPv4 addresses. Um, so that is the reason why we're moving on to IPv6 to give us way more uh, options. Um, you know, everything's on the internet now. <laughs> we we've run we're running out of these things. Um, so IPv6 is important and is up upcoming. Um, and you can see it's longer here. It's got letters and numbers in it. Um, and you know, everything's not compatible with AAA records yet or quadruple A records yet with, with IPv6, but things that are can get your, um, can get, can retrieve these IP addresses, uh, which work the same, which work, you know, the same way these do. Um, but it's just a different protocol version, um, that allows for a little more information to be passed. So you can use both of these things to point at whatever address that you need for anyone who's using IPv6 or everyone who's using IPv4. The next thing is a C name record. Um, and so this is actually what, um, these are becoming bigger and bigger. Um, and in the, in the, the cloud has kind of changed the way that you can do some cool things, uh, with DNS and, and pointing to things and, and networking and, um, C names are canonical names. So canonical names, um, we talked about domain names, uh, domain, the domain name service being a mapping of a domain name over to an IP address. Uh, a C name or canonical name is actually a mapping of a domain name to a, another domain name. Uh, so it's not a redirect, um, but it is a pointing at another domain name. Uh, it's pretty interesting. I'll show you how these are used. This is how actually um, my sites are hosted um, due to some static hosting and um, some, some ways we have these things set up. It'll also make more sense when we get into the cloud portion, but canonical name, I'll show you that We'll get into some DNS commands and tools, and I'll show you what my site is pointed at. Uh, then we've got another record, like an MX record. Um, these are just, these are not all, this is not an exhaustive list of DNS records. This is just some of the important ones. Um, so the mail exchange, um, so this tells uh, your, this, this tells your domain name, like how to handle mail. So if anyone's ever purchased, um, you know, like a Google business address or like, or a Google or a Microsoft business address or something, they'll have you actually go in. They'll make you actually go into your dashboard and edit, manage your DNS uh, and change your mail records so that mail knows how to get routed to your domain. Um, it really, it matters. So mail exchange records, again, are used uh, for SMTP for mail. Um, and then name server records, you can change, um, you can change the name servers in which you're using to manage DNS for your, um, for your domain. So, um, I can use Google's name servers. If I don't like it, I can point them to actually GoDaddy's name servers. I can have my own name servers to manage this information as well. Um, if I like, but you can use uh, any of those in these name servers, basically, uh, the computer basically does a lookup and says, all right, I see these name servers. I can go here to get the information that I need about your site. Um, and so that's why name servers are important. And again, you can change where your name servers go. All right, let me take a sip. 
the code. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I do like this sweatshirt. I'm a little warm right now, but um, yeah. Is C name for subdomains? Um, you can you can use a C name for a for a, a Apex domain, and actually you have to. Uh, I think you have to for for some things. Um, it's not it, it's not only for subdomains. I do not believe. Maybe it is. I don't know. Um, I think so. I, I I didn't think so, but um, we can check. Actually, no. I think you're right. I think you can't. I think you can't point a an apex domain at a, at a um, at a C name. I don't think so. Then yes, but we'll see. We'll see in a second. Um, I'll confirm that. I don't. I don't. I never remember. I just know when I run into problems. I'm like, oh yeah, can't do that. Um, cool. Now, what are some tools that we can use um, to uh, interact with DNS to get in, to to do DNS lookups ourselves? Um, to, to be able to get information about DNS because it's really important to be able to do a lot of these things yourselves. What are some tools you have available to you in Linux? Again, I said we will be learning Linux, um, more Linux tools throughout this entire course. Let's talk about these things right now. Uh, can you actually make your own DNS server and people your server to get to the right IP. Yes, you yes, you can you can make your own DNS server no problem. Um it's actually not that hard. It's difficult managing um zone files and managing like the DNS records itself. It can be a little annoying um learning how to do that. Um but yeah, uh setting up bind servers um is something you can do. You can get a $5 server off of off of uh, DigitalOcean or something and you can absolutely do that yourself if you like. Um Again, I think it'll be something fun to learn, but I think it's very similar to like managing your own mail server. It's way more trouble than it's worth, um, to be 100% honest. Um, so, but it's it could be a good learning experience for sure. But let's do some of these cool commands right here. All right, we are going to bash again. I really need to change this. All right, so the first thing we're going to use is dig. So let's man dig. Let's again, we're getting in the habit of using these tools. So we're checking the manual for dig and dig very simply that it's a DNS lookup utility. Exactly what we want to try out right now. So dig is a flexible tool for interrogating DNS name servers. So this allowed dig allows you to from the command line query name servers to get information about domains from it. Um, it is, it performs DNS lookups and displays the answers that are returned from the name servers that were queried. Uh, most DNS administrators use dig to troubleshoot DNS problems because of its flexibility, ease of use and clarity of output. Other lookup tools tend to have less functionality than dig that in fact, I believe is a dig at NS lookup that we're going to learn next, but cool. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's see how dig works here. So, um, we can do something like this dig. Uh, Google.com. We can go ahead and practice and dig a lot of things. And I encourage you uh, on your computer to go ahead and start digging things um, and just seeing information. So we do this, we get a bunch of information um, here, header, everything. Um, but uh, your eyes are going to want to drop down to these sections, really to this answer section um, is kind of most important. Uh, sometimes you'll get more than this. Um, and you can see here, this is the IP address in which uh, this is the a record. This is the host record um, in which uh, Google.com is pointed at. So I'm going to copy that and you'll see that if I copy this and I actually go up to here and I paste this in my browser, I hit enter. It actually goes to Google.com because again, that is uh, that's the that's the way that um, that's the way that we know what Google's address is. So that's that's Google's actual address. All right. So um, you can also do other things with dig. You can dig um, dash C name. You can pass in um, whoops uh, specific records that you want to get. So if I wanted to get a C name record or see if there was one available, I could um, I could do that. Um, let's actually look at the man page for dig. Um, I think I can do like, I can check for like MX records and all kinds of stuff. Um, so see here, I can pass in some options and only look for IPv4 or IPv6 if I needed it. Um, 
I could do all, I could do batch mode so I could pass in a list of files. You could do a bunch of stuff. You could do a bunch of stuff in here, a whole lot of stuff in here, but you can use it to get a bunch of information. So I think I can do, can I do like big MX? Um, yeah, so I can get like MX records. So now you can see here, it doesn't give me back the A record that we got previously. We went ahead and got this MX record. Uh, hey, Boom Cat, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Um, but yes, you can see here, now we have the MX records. These are the mail records for Google. These are the servers and addresses in which mail uh, should be delivered. Uh, these got some numbers here. Mail actually has priority um, listed inside of them. Um, so yeah, uh, so it'll try, it'll try this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one, and then this one because of these priority numbers. Um, cool. Uh, so yes, yeah, so you can, you can get different records. Um, so let's do like mine. Um, we could do big like mastermind.io. Um, and you can see here, I have some A records here. Um, and then if I do like a C name, it's not going to work because um this is a again top level domain so there's no c name so if there's no record and you try to query it it'll respond sometimes but it won't have it here but for things like academy um this is actually pointed at a c name this actually only is actually pointed at a c name which is to basically um a cdn we'll talk about cdns but this is hosted you know in s3 and amazon um but yeah you can just get uh information and query information about um about a website, cool. You can do that, and it's cool. Uh, but that's all. That's what Dig does. Um, Dig just allows you to query DNS, and it's great for getting this type of information. It's great to see if IP addresses have changed. Like Dig is a great tool. You'll you'll use this a lot. Um, Dig is also great to see if like your system can. It's an, I mean, ping and other things are great, but it's also an indicator to see if your machine can reach the internet and things like that. Um, but yeah. Uh, let's hack Google. Um, I don't know how to hack Google. And if I did, I, I might, I thought they would pay me. I thought they would pay me for coming to them and letting them know how I did it so they could close it up, but we'll see. Oh yes. Yes. Uh, actually I think we were, I think, um, we were going to go over MX toolbox, but the things that you're going to be doing here, uh, the things that you're going to be doing from dig and stuff, there is a great tool. Um, Ari Win Winokur um, said it in the chat, uh, MX Toolbox. Um, I spent the first, I, man, I spent the first like four years of my career using MX, MX Toolbox. It does, um, in, a, in an, you can say an easier way, the same things that a that you do, can do with Dig, the same kind of queries um, you can do in MX Toolbox. It is a quality site. Um, and feel free, feel free. I know we're learning Linux tools, but absolutely throw out uh, the, the goal is to make your job easier. Um, the only reason I want you to know how to do this is sometimes, um, I don't know, maybe, you won't, maybe you'll be somewhere that you can't to get to this. Um, but MX Toolbox allows you, again, to do the same things and to check mail records and to do a lot of cool things. You'll get a bunch more information um, out of the box if you don't want to have to know what all the flags and stuff are to pass in a dig. But absolutely, uh, that is a great call out for sure. Um, cool. That is the dig command. Now let's look, uh, let's look at NS lookup. So NS lookup, let's man it again. Cause this is how we're going to start getting our informations. This our information about these tools. Um, NS lookup query internet name servers interactively. So again, no pun intended, but I believe NS lookup is the tool that, um, that dig was taking a dig at saying, uh, it has a better kind of output than other tools which is interesting. Um, but uh, NSLOOKUP is a program that uh, to query internet domain name servers. Uh, NSLOOKUP has two methods, interactive and non-interactive. Interactive mode allows users to query name servers for information about various hosts and domains or to print out a list of hosts and domains. Non-interactive mode is used to print just the name and requested information for host or domain. Now, I actually didn't know, I actually don't use NSLOOKUP anymore. Um, well, I, I haven't had the need to use it in a long time. I used to use it a lot. I didn't know about these two modes. Um, so I'm not even sure. Oh, forgot my dog was right here. Um, I actually don't, I'm actually interested to see what this is. Um, interactive mode is entered in the following cases when no arguments are given. So I guess I'm used to using it in interactive mode. Uh, when the first argument is a hyphen. Yeah, I think I'm used to 
using an interactive mode. So let's try this. Let's see what the, how the output differs from these two tools. Um, and let's look up google.com. And here we go. We get, uh, so we actually get cleaner output. Um, yeah, we get a cleaner output. Um, but yeah, we, 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 <laughs> it's interesting cause it, it actually pulled it from my local machine. Um, because I have it, I have that obviously cached locally. That's what this is here. Yeah, it's cleaner. It's definitely cleaner. Um, and let's see what, what can we pass in? Uh, Domain LS not implemented, not implemented. Um, interesting. All right, cool. Well, you can you can dig into NS lookup if you want, or you can not take an NS lookup. You can look at NS lookup if you want. Um, uh, but you get uh, it looks like you get just a list. It's a little bit cleaner to to use. I've been using Dig um, for the past couple of years. Um, I used to use this a long time ago. Um, can you pass in things like uh, like something like uh, so? I guess that put it into Q uh, C. Let's go over. Hmm. Okay, I didn't give me that. Just messing around with it again. I haven't used it. Look up in a while. Is it is a tool that exists? You can use it to do your DNS uh, lookups. No big deal. Just want to mess around with it. Uh, you can do some DNS queries on that as well. So let's take a look at our next tool. Um, who is so? Um, yes, we can do some DNS queries, um, but sometimes we also might need to find out information about. Um, about a domain, um, so you can actually find out. Uh, pub there, there's public information that's that's published when you purchase a domain. Uh, your name and address and phone number and stuff um, uh, is taken down when you do that. Um, but you can't hide it. Uh, you can make it private. But who is 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 used to actually? Let's, let's just check their actual. Oh, do I not have who is? Oh, so who is must interesting. Let's go ahead and install it. Hello, apt install. Ah, you see that? I didn't even have to look at my keyboard, but I do have to look at my keyboard for my password. I'm getting better. I'm getting slowly, slowly getting better. Um, so I'm gonna install who is really quick. Um, but now I should be able to man it. Man, who is? All right. So a client for the who is directory service. So let me show you um something. What is that? I think it's by ICANN. Yeah. So there's an organization called ICANN, the Internet uh, Corporation for Assigned Names. Um, and what ICANN has a giant database, again, when you purchase domain names, um, and ICANN allows, uh, like it, it holds this database, it, it holds all the information about the domains that are out there. Um, and so you can query this to find out information about domains. Why would you want to do something like this? Uh, maybe someone has a domain name that you want to purchase. They own it. They're not using it for anything. You want to purchase it. Uh, there's, there's a number of reasons someone's doing, someone's, uh, maybe you, someone is like, you one of their servers is hacked and they're they're you know ddosing your site or something you need to contact them or they've stolen some of your information you need to contact them to to make them uh take down you know at request that they take down things um there's a number of reasons why you need to do this um and i can allows you to look up that information that is public again it can be hidden hidden um yeah it can be hidden um and again it's it's the i can who is database lookup uh so um who is allows you to do it from the command line. And again, um, something that's not really needed um, as often, but I've used it a fair amount. But again, you can just do something like who is um, let's do IGN. We talked about IGN earlier. You get a bunch of information. Um, and so if the information is public. Uh, you'll get a bunch. You'll, you'll know where it was purchased from, who the registrar is, uh, the registrar being the company that the domain was purchased from. Um, so it could be GoDaddy and or again, like it could be Google. It could be a bunch of different places. Um, the date it was purchased, the date it was um, the date it expires. So if you're watching a domain um, wanting to buy it, and you want to know when it's going to expire <clears throat> and you want to just kind of wait and see you can find out when it expires um here so it looks like they purchased this through 2026 um 
yeah, you can get information about the registrar um, and registrar abuse contact email. So if there's, you know, if that domain is doing something to you that you, uh, it, that is abuse, you can kind of report those things. A um, bunch of information. You get some name server information. Um, then there's just some like uh, general notices, uh, terms of use here. Uh, and then you can get, this is where you can get some of the information about someone. Um, uh, you can get you can get their address, you can get email addresses, uh, real street addresses of companies, real street addresses of people's homes, uh, all kinds of stuff inside of who is. So if you ever want to know again, if you ever let's say you wanted to purchase. Uh, uh, I'm the best dot com. And maybe I shouldn't be going to random websites live on stream because you never know what you're going to run into. But I'm the best dot com. Looks like someone already owns this and it's for sale and ready to purchase. They give you a number, but maybe they didn't give you a number and you really, really want it. I'm the best.com. I'm assuming because they want to sell. This is public. Um, so you just go who is and I'm the best dot dot com. And in here, um, it doesn't look like it's Look, it's private. So let's purchase to GoDaddy. Um, we can see it expires in uh, in June of 2020. Uh, we can see who to contact. Um, it doesn't look like they. It looks like they're hiding their select contain domain holder link. Uh, so it looks like you can go through uh, GoDaddy to find out this information. Let's see. Name find. So yeah, cool. So we got a little information on name find LLC. We can contact them if we wanted to buy it. But again, it's just an, it's just a cool tool to be able to access some of that information. So um, you can install that, mess around with that. Now we talked about your um, we talked about uh, local DNS caching. We talked about that your computer would actually check locally to try to resolve DNS before reaching out to other servers. Um, it, the, uh, there's a, there's a file called SE host. And I think we did this uh, live on stream one of the other nights. So, um, on a Linux, on a Linux machine, um, if you look in uh, slash ETC, hopefully y'all, hopefully anyone who has a Google classroom, watch that video on uh, Linux folder structures. Um, but if I CD into slash ETC or slash Etsy, I'm gonna do LS. There's a bunch of stuff in here. There's a there's a bunch of configuration. Basically, these are mostly just configuration files in here. But there's a file called hosts. So by vim slash sc host. Um, there's this file right here, and it is simply a, a, it's, it's exactly like DNS. It's it, it is DNS basically. It's a mapping of an IP address to a domain name. So it's IP address, space domain name, ignore the little arrows in there. That's my Vim. Uh, that's my Vim configuration and settings. Uh, just putting in things to, to let you know that there are spaces uh, in here. Uh, those are not actually there. Um, so you can see here, remember we talked about uh, the like home and lo or local host. Um, this is why uh, the IP address for your for local host for home is 127.0.0.1. But we can type in localhost, the domain name localhost, and it will still, uh, that will still work. And so this is usually set up on every single Linux computer, um, all computers, um, for, for, to be able to reference, uh, your internal or yourself, uh, via IP address. Um, and then you can see some random stuff here that I was messing around with to kind of show you that stuff. But, um, Again, I can use this um, to also do something like this. Like if I also want, um, I can read, I can use this to redirect domain names. So let's say I purchased domain. Let's say I purchased uh, a brand new domain, mastermind2.com. Um, and let's say I was building it. It wasn't ready to go out on a server yet. It didn't exist on a server. Um, and I wanted to see it locally. I wanted to see it as if I was actually um, going uh, going to the site, maybe my configuration for my uh, my website, um, you know, referenced, you know, uh, uh, for some reason I hard coded um, URLs in there. Um, and, I, and so I, I didn't actually have a setup anywhere. I could uh, point like mastermind to, well, I can't edit it right now, but um, 
I can't save it. Um, I could do like mastermind2.com and I can point it here. I don't have to own the domain or anything. I can point anyone's website locally on my computer. I can point anybody's website to another location. If I want, if I hate Google and I just naturally am used to type it in Google, but I would rather go to DuckDuckGo because I care about my privacy, which I, I'm not sure. Um, I could go ahead and I could, I could find the IP address for, for DuckDuckGo and I can put that I could put that uh, right here. So this is the duck, duck, go. Wow, I'm struggling. Wow. Um, and I could put like google.com here. And every time I went to Google, it will go ahead and send me to the duck, duck, go IP address. Maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't uh, because of the headers, because of the host name that's passed in. But you can, this is how you can manipulate local DNS. Um, and host files are, you use these for troubleshooting very often. You use these for a number of things. Um, uh, the way, because of the way computing has evolved, um, this isn't quite as important, but there are certainly times when uh, you'll have to utilize your host files uh, to um, be able to more easily refer to internet network computers. So maybe you have um, seven servers all in, in a like internal network and you want them to be able to interact with each other and move files around between them, but you don't want to refer to the servers by their IP addresses. You want, you want to be able to type in server number one or server number two, server number three, server number four, five, six, seven. Um, and so you can set up um, records here so that these servers can know um, what IP address to refer to when you do exactly that. So that is, uh, that is that. Um, yes, we will be going over TCIP a little bit um, soon, I believe. I'm pretty sure it's in here. Um, sure. So um, yes, if you ever need to uh, change DNS or, or test or uh, whatever, your, your host file, Etsy host is a very important thing to remember. It's funny because I had forgot, like, because I've been doing a lot of stuff in the cloud and actually haven't been working on like, like real servers in a long time. I remember it, like some, some issue came up and I was like, ah, oh, like, how do I get to this? And we're, we're all sitting there and we're all like, host file. Like, I can't believe we forgot about that. I like, I used to rely on my host file, um, but it is a, it's a cool way. It's a, it's a really cool tool um, to be able to do some things. Um, and the next thing we're going to do is there in here, there's also a resolve.com in here. Now, do not touch this right now. Do not touch this. I'm showing it to you. The slash Etsy hosts. Oh, whoops. Wrong thing. There's slash Etsy host. And then there's slash Etsy slash resolve.com. Uh, so this file is managed by a uh, different um, service. So it's saying do not edit. Um, that's another reason why I told you not to edit it. Um, it's a dynamic resolve conf uh, connecting local clients to internal DNS stub resolver. Um, yeah, sub resolver. This uh, file lists all configured search domains. So um, this allows you to, this resolve.conf allows you to basically point to various name servers to check for local DNS, to check if you have things. Currently, you can actually see here that this is uh, this is a local uh, IP address. 53 is the port uh, that DNS actually runs over, but um, you can use this for a number of things. Let's say local DNS is super weird. Let's say you're having problems and like, things aren't resolving, but you believe they should be. Um, and you wanna check if it's this computer or actual, uh, the, the rest of the internet, you can change this to point at other name servers. So a common one people will point it at is, uh, Google has a, um, Google has a name server uh, that you can point to with an, an easy to remember IP address of 8.8.8.8. .8 so if you ever want to, if you ever need to check uh, these things, you would have to comment out this line below it, but you can change this to, to change um, where DNS, uh, local DNS goes to resolve. Um, yeah, and so it's a cool tool as well. Um, you can use this for a number of things. Um, and, and, and DNS is a, there's a, there's like a saying that says like uh, DNS is always the problem, but, um, yeah, a DNS is a problem a lot of times. Um, so this is another tool. This resolve.conf is another tool for you to be able to, uh, to troubleshoot. So, um, that is that. And I think that's everything on DNS. We have a lot of stuff left. Yeah, we don't have that much stuff left. Perfect. 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 Just over nine. We're good to go. So. That's everything on DNS. Any questions? 
about DNS before we go on to some other things. Curl Resolve, Etsy hosts. Um, let, me, let me start from the top. <clears throat> we do SSH tunneling. We're about to learn about SSH tonight uh, to network jump boxes. Yep. And redirect to various applications, ports, and local hosts. Absolutely. Um, it's really good to eat for that. Post file is life. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is good. It's just interesting. Like again, I don't deal with. Um, we we just I, we don't. We do a lot of all of our infrastructure is, is immutable um, currently. So like, I don't really deal with a lot of servers. So if there's if there's networking issues, we just like <clears throat> we change it via code and blow it away. And sure, you can use host files, especially to troubleshoot if you can't figure stuff out. But we just we haven't. Our setup uh, for the past few years hasn't needed it. So, anyone read the case of the 500 mile email thing? Just found it on Reddit earlier. Pretty cool. I have not read that. Let me add that to my things. Uh, I love Reddit. I also love uh, stuff like that. 500 mile email. All right. I got that on my list of things to check out. Is it always DNS that's broken? Uh, it's not always, um, but DNS, DNS, it can, DNS is finicky. It's, it's definitely finicky and it can cause problems uh, for sure. Um, I, yeah, I, RDP is fine, but yeah, no, I say channeling is better. Okay, let's move on to some sweet, sweet protocols. Now, we learned about um, kind of just the networking layers, the OSI model, the networking layers that allow, uh, that allow, that it kind of enable uh, the internet to work. Um, and then we learned about uh, DNS, which is the service that basically uh, the internet is kind of built on to be able to translate domain names to uh, IP addresses and, and around, and to help your requests get to where they need to go. Uh, now let's talk about the protocols that the internet is built on. So, um, HTTP, um, it's something you've for sure interacted with, uh, 150% guaranteed that you've interacted with this before. Um, but it is a web communication, uh, protocol for sending and receiving text based messages. That's very important. Uh, text based messages. It runs over port 80. So we're going to be talking about Linux ports. Uh, we started talking about a, a bit when we were uh, using the net stack command in the part two of Linux. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we'll talk about these various port numbers. Uh, uh, you will you will have to start memorizing these port numbers. Again, you can serve HTTP over other ports, but by default, it, it, it is over port 80. Um, and it stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And so whenever you see HTTP colon slash slash um, on the front, like on the front in your web browser, uh, this is using HTTP. You probably can't get to many sites like this anymore, though, to be honest, uh, through Google, um, because this is not secure. But this is the this is the uh, the, the protocol of the web. Um, it's the protocol of the web. Uh, I forgot. Oh, I didn't see your name. Oh, Zam, Zama the Zama. Welcome. Thank you for the follow. Um, cool. So, someone, I think someone just asked what's the difference between HTTP and HTTPS. Um, so, HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Again, remember port 80. And HTTPS is the secured version. So, Hypertext Transfer Protocol secure. And I didn't, I can't believe I messed this up. Let's go ahead and throw the S on there. Um, uh, so this is what you'll see commonly. So when you see that little lock in the corner of your of your um, browser, uh, it's HTTPS. So HTTPS will proceed the domain name. And so this is the protocol that it's going to use uh, to connect. Um, this runs over port 443 by default. So this is very important. Like this is something you need to know. Port 80 is HTTP and port 443 is HTTPS. You'll generally need to enable both of those things for a number of reasons. Like you want people to, yes, port 80 is not secure, but you want people to be able to uh, make requests over that port, uh, mostly so that you can redirect them to 443 if need be, but you want them to be able to get to you. Um, people aren't just typing in HTTPS. Uh, if you don't have a redirect in place, um, yeah, uh, you should put a redirect in place. But um, again, it's secure. So data 
uh, transferred between the server and the computer is encrypted is encrypted that's why the lock is there in the corner so basically data that's transferred in between that server and your computer uh, is encrypted um, during transportation and so like people uh, it's safer because someone who grabs that data uh, won't be able to read it if someone is able to grab that data uh, theoretically they will not be able to read it or to decode um, the encryption um, algorithm uh, for that so they got data but they can't really do anything with it um, and then the encryption is actually enabled via SSL slash TLS. Uh, um, it's actually nowadays enabled only via TLS. Um, yes, fire mixtape, definitely in theory, um, definitely in theory. Um, but everything is TLS now. There's actually, yeah, there's actually no, not no such thing, but TLS is the thing now, but they're used synonymously, uh, SSL and TLS. Currently you'll hear SSL a lot more because that was the old protocol. Um, yeah, so important thing to remember here, these are the two uh, protocols that the internet basically uh, is built over, uh, HTTP and HTTPS. Again, the HTTP stands for Hypertext Protocol, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTP runs over port 80, HTTPS runs over 443. Remember those port numbers uh, and that HTTPS is encrypted. Um, cool, keep you safe, keep you a little bit safe. It'll try. So let's talk about SSL and TLS. So we just said, we just said the HTTPS is secured uh, as in, the encryption is enabled via SSL slash TLS. So let's talk about what SSL and TLS is because we got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of, um, of what are they called when the, the A word, uh, I'm losing it. Hold on, hold on. Why does my mind just go blank? Uh, the, the word I'm looking for. Someone tell me in the chat. I know this word. I can't believe I'm having a brain fart. A, A, come on, you got, yeah, no, 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 no. When, when there are uh, three letter, four letter words that are, that are uh, basically sentences and you just take the first letter of each word, man, why does my brain, no, oh, you got, you guys, are, are you guys trolling me? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, things like uh, acronym, thank you. Oh my gosh, I, man, acronym. Wow, I, lo I really lost it. I had a big brain fart there. Yeah, keep dropping them. Keep, I like all these words. I learned I learned that first word the very first class, even though I've already forgotten it. Um, but keep dropping them. I, I know what all these words mean, though. Alliteration. Uh, I guess you could say alliteration for if SSL was SSS, but it's not. Acronym. Cool. Um, yes, thank you. Um, acronyms. Um, there's a lot of acronyms here, four letters and three letter acronyms. Let's learn about what they mean. So SSL. This acronym stands for Secure Socket Layer. Um, yeah, super important. Yeah, Secure Socket Layer. But again, Secure Socket Layer is not really a thing anymore. It's, a, it's not really a thing anymore. But um, I actually, I know what I, my wife is. Uh, she's in the she's in the medical field, uh, so I actually know what anaphylaxis is. So you know, you dropping words that I do know, even though I don't know anagram. Even I know anagram. Even though I couldn't remember acronym, even though I know what that is too, I know what anaphylaxis is, but I don't know what that word above it is. And oh, anticlimactic, I know what that is as well. See, man, I'm smart sometimes. I'm very smart sometimes. But cool. SSL, secure socket layer. TLS is transport layer security. And this is the method in which we actually uh, used to secure things now. SSL is deprecated, which means it is old, it is not supported anymore, um, throw it away. TLS rises, so SSL is old, TLS is new, and it is the dominant uh, format. It is, it's, it's what we are using now. Uh, both use certificates that are not dependent on the protocol. So um, yes, they're certificate, they, they use these things called certificates uh, to do the encryption. Um, and they're not dependent upon the protocol. So you might hear things like SSL certificates, um, which aren't really a thing anymore again, because they're TLS certificates, but, uh, but yes, come on. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. I almost spelled that in like a fourth grade spelling bee, but I spelled it one letter, one letter off because I spelled it anti-des, like D-E-S, because I didn't know the origins of the word, even though it's anti-dis, which is weird because it's uh, it's the double negative, it's anti and then it's dis. See, man, I'm telling you guys, I, I know something. I, I know something. Uh, I know a little bit of stuff. Uh, maybe not fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, or I don't know. I failed. You know what's funny? I lost that because I couldn't spell the word lawn. And I don't know why, but it makes 
you know, it makes perfect sense now. But I think when I was trying to sound it out at the time, I almost felt anti-establishmentarianism. But the word lawn, that that W really threw me off at the time. I was like, oh, L-O-U. N lawn. See, that's how you spell it. That's how everyone should spell it. But uh, I almost won. I got real close. I'll never forget that. I was really, I was like upset with myself about that. But cool. SSL certificates. Um, great. Let's go on because we'll, those will make more sense in practice. Um, actually, no, 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 no. Let me show you something. Um, these SSL certificates, basically, um, and a, uh, a key, there's a key that gets put. So take a look at this. Like, let's say we go to google.com. You can actually get information about this certificate that is used to secure this connection. You click this, lets us know that our connection is secure. It says the certificate is valid. So this is where they're talking about the TLS certificate. Uh, again, most people are going to say SSL certificate for you, but you can go ahead and click on this. And I know this is tiny. But you can go ahead and do it yourself um, and you can see um, information about this uh, SSL certificate, um, about the kind of chain that is um, is securing it, um, the people who are authorizing it. Uh, you cannot you, you can generate your own. You can generate your own SSL certificates. Uh, these are called self signed certificates. Um, and so if you, if you generate your own and you actually put them on your website, when you go to, uh, when someone goes to your website, it will show that it is both secure. It'll show a lock, but it'll show like a broken lock because although you're securing that connection, uh, it is not authorized through a trusted uh, certificate authority. So certificate authorities are companies. There's these people who um, can certify that the, uh, the, the certificate that is given to you uh, that has been uh, issued to your domain name because uh, the certificate gets issued to your domain name. So if I, you know, I, I purchased mastermind.io, I would have to get a certificate that covers mastermind.io and any subdomains I would like. You can use a wildcard and get star.mastermind.io to cover those things, but it is issued per uh, domain. Um, but a certificate authority would uh, be the authorizer who says, hey, you all can trust that this certificate is good because uh, we are one of the companies that is designed to do this. Uh, there are a number of certificate authorities. You used to have to pay a bunch of money for SSL certificates. You still can. Um, if you'd like to waste a bunch of money, uh, you can go ahead and go to like DigiCert or uh, or Symantec, which might be DigiCert now. Um, but you could purchase super expensive SSLs if you'd like. Um, but don't. Uh, there are better ways nowadays. You can actually get certificates for free uh, that are actually um, that are secure and trusted. And you can see here, you, you know, there's a time when we were paying hundreds of dollars, you know, for two year certificate, uh, not a thing anymore. Do not do this. I know they want you to do it, but don't Amazon will give you them for free. Uh, there's a, there's a application. There's a program called a uh, service called let's let's encrypt, which you can set up to also get it for free. Uh, but yeah, but if you're doing any testing or something, you can do something, you can create self-signed certificates. Um, and we're actually going to be creating self-signed certificates. Um, I believe in the lab that we have, we're going to create some self-signed certificates, uh, just for fun, just so you can see what that process is like. Um, just to get you familiar with those things. All right, let's move on a little further. Now we can actually, these last two things, um, We'll actually spin up a little, we'll spin up a server real quick. Um, and so you guys can see how these things work, but, um, two other important protocols. So, uh, right now we're using a graphical user interface to manage our computer. And again, a lot of times on servers, you're not going to have um, a graphical user interface. Um, so what are some methods? What are some protocols that, um, what are some methods and protocols that we can use to uh, kind of move files around, move uh, data around and, and get things from one place to another? Let's talk about uh, some popular protocols. So the first one we're going to talk about is FTP, which is the file transfer protocol. Now, um, I, let's go through this first and then I'll talk about it a little more, but it's the file transfer protocol. So again, it's a protocol specifically designed to allow you to transfer files over it. Uh, this runs, um, uh, over port 21 did it's port 20 and 21 oh i didn't know that what's uh it's it's 20 um ftps uh i believe it, is it also 20 Con confirm that for me um if if so 
um, or is it SFTP? Well, I can never remember which one's which. There's so just, just to throw you for a loop. There's uh, SFTP and there's FTPS. Uh, one operates over SSH, which you're about to learn about, and one operates over a different uh, secure port. Uh, but yeah, so SFTP is 22. Uh, SFTPS uh, S is maybe it's maybe it's actually still over port 21, but with uh, with a with a key or something. I don't know. Um, but cool. Over 20 as well. I didn't know that. Learn something new. Uh, 20 is data. Passive FTP is all 21. Oh, OK, cool. Learn something new there. But it is. So I'm actually going to add that because we should update things as we get new information. I trust you guys. You might be telling me something wrong, but I trust you. All right. I'll say and and not or um, and I'll, I'll add some more information when I find out more about that. Active and passive transfers. Cool. That makes sense. Um, so it's used to transfer files from a local machine to a remote server. Uh, you can also use it to transfer from a remote server to another machine. Um, but FTP um, by default is not uh, generally a thing that is um, enabled. Um, generally, you have to install some type of FTP server um, on there. Let's see, graph F, uh, FTP SE services. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. The, the SC services thing. I forgot about that. Man, that was really, it's funny because I, I asked someone the day after you told me about that before. Um, blah, maybe it wasn't you, Blast, but someone told me about this before when we were doing uh, some of the Linux stuff. And someone else who's been using Linux for a long time was like, I didn't know anything about this SC services thing. Uh, yeah, like, man, I, I really didn't know. Um, do I have to cat it first? No, just that makes sense. Um, do I have to LS first? Um, well, I'll just try FTP. I'll do what you told me. Grab FTP slash Etsy uh, services. Uh, cool. FTP 20, FTP data. I mean, FTP data 20, FTP 21, uh, FTP over SSL, FTPS. Okay, cool. Dope. I, I'm, I really need to add that to my uh, to my repertoire. Repa, repertoire. Um, cool. Dope city. Um, so, um, some <laughs> FTP is a protocol. Um, you can do FTP from the command line, but generally you need to have uh, an FTP server, FTP service running um, on the machine for you to be able to uh, operate with it properly. Um, so, uh, FileZilla uh, is a client or a server that you can download. It's a common one that people use. Um, pretty cool. It's it's a, you can download a graphical one. Um, and you can use it basically to, uh, you get the server's IP address, uh, you generally use it in a password, and you uh, log into that computer, and then you can uh, kind of, usually you can navigate the file structure. So yeah, I'm on my, my computer, but I can connect to a remote computer and see the file structure, and I can generally copy and paste and, uh, and, and slide things around as I would like. Um, uh, yeah, so FileZilla is the, the, kind of the main one I've, uh, I've used. Um, so it's very interesting because FileZilla used to be a big, uh, or, or FTP rather, um, used to be a huge thing. It's, it's, it's the preferred method for like everyone, like, like, uh, especially like, like WordPress developers and like, like CM, any kind of CMS developer stuff to move, to move content, uh, onto their servers, uh, to remote servers and things like that. Um, I, once I found out that you could do it over, uh, once I found out about the next two protocols or the next one, one of the next two protocols, uh, I started using that instead. And I've, I've actually stayed away from, um, I've stayed away from FTP almost like completely. I can't even remember the last time I've used FTP to transfer anything. Maybe we can, uh, we're gonna spin up a server in a second. Maybe we can uh, set up FTP on there and I can show you kind of how that works um, in there. But again, FTP is, FTP is one of the easier protocols to remember because you know it's just file transfer protocol. Um, yeah, makes sense. That's how you move some files around. We'll we'll do some FTP in a second. Um, and then there's SSH and SCP. Um, these are very important. Um, SSH is secure shell. So shell, remember we talked about shells. Um, we talk about bash things like this. Uh, it is what allow. It is a protocol which allows you to um, to remotely connect 
to a Linux machine. So a Linux server that doesn't have a graphical user interface, or even if it does, um, it allows SSH is the protocol that allows me to log into a remote machine um, and basically log into its shell. So that runs um, over port 22. Uh, but there's also this secure copy protocol. So SCP is, we learned about the CP command, which is the copy command. Um, and that's to, co that's to copy files from one place to another on a file system. Uh, but secure, secure copy protocol allows you to copy things from a local machine to a remote machine over the SSH protocol. So over port 22, using the SSH protocol, using the secure shell protocol, it allows you to pass data and move uh, things over. So this is why I generally use SCP to move things around rather than FTP. Um, yeah, um, that's, that's generally what I use, um, but uh, they both have their trade-offs um, and it's a matter of preference um, a little bit after that. But um, uh, I actually don't think there's, I think I think there's only a, well, there are some graphical SCP tools for, for that. There's WinSCP and some other stuff. Um, if you want a, uh, a graphical SCP tool, but yes, um, it's so again, SSH is used to gain secure access to a shell on a remote machine. So from your local machine to another one and SCP is used to transfer files from one machine to another uh, over the SSH uh, protocol. So over port 22. So I'm going to show you SSH and SCP and FTP live in a second. Uh, so we're going to spin up some brand new servers for us to log into. Uh, to do that. So before we go and do the hands-on piece, uh, are there any questions about any of the things that we've uh, talked over, talked about so far? Active passive thing in port 20 is used for the actual data transfer or the files. So we must use for transfer commands on a server uh, is about what ports to use. I think active is when you connect 21 to the FTP server, what port to connect back to your machine on interesting actually i i don't know an answer I, I don't really know um i don't remember any of that um so i don't know the answer to that i don't want to i don't want to give you false information all right here's what we're gonna do we're gonna log into aws uh maybe we'll log into digital ocean Well, let's log into Digital Ocean. Only reason we're going to log into Digital Ocean is because uh, there are a few more factors uh, to log into uh, to get into a AWS machine. Um, but that may be valuable since we're going to be doing AWS stuff. Let's see. Maybe we'll, we'll see real quick. I actually don't even know if I have a Digital Ocean account still. Can't I? Genuinely can't remember. Uh, 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 so again, DigitalOcean is a place if you want to go, uh, you can get some cheap, simple development servers. Um, I know people who uh, exclusively develop on, you know, servers and things that they've purchased from DigitalOcean uh, or or some other cloud uh, provider or, or VPS provider um, like, like Linode or uh, which other ones. Uh, even Amazon has one called, um, called LightSail, I believe. And I don't know why this is taking so long. Um, in my email, I'll check it here. So you guys aren't looking in my email. Actually, I can grab it from up here where you cannot see. Uh, let's see. Uh, that is another benefit. Uh, this is another benefit of, uh, having the two computers set up with the, uh, little server in between is because before I had a lot of trouble, uh, hiding secrets from everyone and, uh, now I don't have that problem. And not so much secrets. This is not really secrets, but makes it a little bit easier. I'm in. We made it. I haven't been in here in a long time. Oh, I forgot I was running things out of here. Uh, if anyone wants, uh, if anyone wants any, um, actually, let's do some shameless self promotion or family promotion. Uh, one of the things that I'm running out of here, I completely forgot I was running out of here. Head over to Flickr to Flames. Flames.com. 
And this is just my wife's blog. It's a it's a health and wellness blog. You can see us. We look so cute together right here. Um, but she got a lot of stuff about um, a wellness on here. Uh, she's getting her master's now in nutrition. If anyone's interested in that stuff, check it out. She's got a little bloggy blog here. Look at the flames dot com. Figured I'd throw it out there since I got here. Um, all right, so I'm gonna create a new droplet. I guess I'm gonna create a new droplet. I haven't been in I haven't been in this interface in forever. Um, so let's go ahead and let's see if we can spin up a new server. A droplet, I believe, is a server in DigitalOcean, and we're used to Ubuntu, so we'll just choose Ubuntu. Um, let's go ahead and get 1904 because I just like. I was get 1910. Uh, standard. We'll get the cheapest one. Why? Why is it starting me way up here? All right, there we go. I want the five dollar one. Just five bucks a month. Uh, I want it close to me, so I'll put it in New York one. Uh, so this data center region with the cloud and with services like this, you can choose where it's located uh, across the world, really. I want it to be closest to me um, so that my internet connection doesn't need to travel around the world and back. Um, I'm gonna, I don't need any of this stuff cause I'm gonna do this. So, um, fine. This is just like Amazon now. Um, so uh, we're gonna use an SSH key. Oh, whack, whack, this is whack. Hold on, they're gonna make me do my own. Oh, this is whack. We're going in. Uh, I could I could do this. Um, this is super easy to do, but this instantly made me this instantly made me angry because. Nope, let's do this. Uh, let's do it via password um, because mm, no, I don't like any of this. We're going to we're going to I, I, I so sometimes there are little things like if you're a service, if you're a cloud service provider, um, where DigitalOcean excelled is that they were kind of easy for developers to use. Um, they're very easy for developers to use. You didn't have to go through a lot of the hassles that Amazon had. Um, and it was kind of quick to just kind of spin up stuff quick. You didn't need to know, uh, have a huge, amazing handle on the cloud um, to do things. Um, but while I 1000% uh, prefer and agree that SSH uh, um, using SSH uh, keys to connect uh, over the SSH protocol. We'll talk about SSH keys in a second, rather than a password. So uh, SSH, you can just use a password and you you try to log into a server, it'll ask you for a password, you enter the password and you're in. Um, and so maybe I'll show you that. Maybe we'll spin up one in both. Um, uh, that's great. Uh, it's not uh, it's not the, the most secure. So SSH keys are, are, are a better way to do it. Um, what I don't like is that uh, if you're gonna use SSH keys, um, you can, they're, they're easy, they are very easy to generate yourself. Uh, generally, you'll, you'll, you'll basically um, generate a, an SSH key pair on your server. And what will happen basically is um, it'll generate two files for you. And one will basically be a lock and one will basically be the key um, to, to unlock that lock. And so what will happen is you will provide you provide one of those to uh, to DigitalOcean or to or to the, whatever machine you're going to be logging into. You'll provide that uh, that that lock basically to all of the systems that you want uh, to, to be able to authenticate using this key. Um, and then anyone who has the key, generally you want to keep that private. There's a public key and a private key, that public key you can pass around in different systems. You can share that. Um, and that's, that's, that's the thing that you're going to authenticate against, but you have this key file locally on your computer that you don't want to share. And when you go to connect, you, you pass along this key, uh, they interact and decide whether or not you can unlock that lock and connect and connect or not. Um, again, it's very easy to generate uh, one of these, very easy to generate one of these, but um, not having to be like developer focused as they are uh, for you to add an SSH key and them not just give it to you, uh, I dislike. Um, I dislike a lot. Um, yeah, they, like now there's no reason for me to basically use there's no reason for me to like, they haven't made it easier for me when Amazon, uh, if you want a new SSH key, you can just download one, uh, which is fine. Um, so we're going to do that real quick, just because we're already going to do stuff with Amazon. Uh, let's see. All 
All right, so this is this is also a good prequel um, to the AWS section. If you've never seen the AWS management uh, console, uh, it's a stupid. Um, it's stupid. Uh, it's, it's it has terrible UX and UI. Uh, even though I love AWS, um, I think it's a. I think I think it's a well done uh, platform. Uh, it, it, it has not done a good job of making things easy for the user. You, you can do a lot of things, a lot of cool things, but they haven't made it easy for you. Um, it's hard to like find what you need in here. There's way too much crap in here. But um, the thing we need to do is spin up, we're gonna spin up an EC2 instance. So EC2 instance, uh, imagine uh, we, we, we spun up virtual machines. We use VirtualBox to spin up a virtual machine. Um, EC2 is basically your virtual machine. So you can have them spin up a virtual machine for you um, that you can log into. So let's go to, what is it? What is this? The new EC2 experience. See, they always try to add new stuff and like, that was weird. Like they're, they're, they're not great, but you can just go right here. We're going to launch an instance. We're going to need to select an AMI, which is the operating system basically that this is going to be using. Again, we will use this. And again, you can see here, free tier eligible. Um, why are all these Ubuntu, oh yeah, there we go. Free tier eligible, so with Amazon, you can uh, spin up servers for free. Um, it is important to note that it's not free forever. Uh, it's free for a certain amount of hours. Um, and I think if you pick the smallest size, it is almost free for an entire year. It's only free for the first year, I believe. Um, and, all of the free servers that you spin up um, all count to that number of hours. So if you like, if you spin up two free servers, it actually will uh, basically cut your amount of free hours in half um, for sure. But cool, we're gonna just spin up uh, just a quick little server here. Um, nothing special, nothing special. Let's just get to the, let's get a little more than eight gigs here in case we use it again. Actually, we get up to 30 free, I think. Let's go 30. Tags, uh, let's give it a name tag. Let's call this uh, SSH uh, test. Um, ignore all the things I'm doing now. Like don't, don't, don't sweat the things I'm doing right now. Um, I'm gonna just do a couple of things for her. I'll leave 22 open. It's FTP on here. Uh, all right, I'll leave 20. What? Custom. We'll leave 20 on there too. Um, and 21. And we'll, I'll let anybody do this. Cool. Um, view and launch. Launch. So here's the key pair part. So I have some existing key pairs, but if I want Amazon to just give me a new key pair, I can say uh, SSH test key pair. And that just downloaded. Now I don't have to do the work, which is, I don't know. I just think, I just think it's better. Uh, AWS keys, I'll download it right here. Um, I don't know. Launch instance. Cool. All right. So now our server is now going to be spinning up this virtual machine. So instead of us uh, setting up our own virtual machine, we basically use Amazon to spin up a virtual machine. Um, and you can see here it's going, it's pending, it happens pretty fast. It'll happen in just a few minutes. Um, and then we can use uh, information to log into this. Let's see. Like where for fresh day is a great example. Oh, thanks, I appreciate that. Put in Amsterdam, Bangalore, Frankfurt, or bust. AWS SSH is super whack. I disagree. I really, I just, I, I, well, I mean, it's the same as, it's the same as everyone's SSH, uh, but keys, I, I, I much prefer keys to passwords, um, for sure. Uh, uh, um. I have a question about the capstone project I'm going to work on. And what do you think for later? Cool, yeah, definitely, definitely reach out and ask about that. Um, can I put Spring Boot application on the servers, on that servers with MySQL? Um, no. Can I push Spring Boot? So Spring Boot is a Java is a Java framework for making uh, web applications. 
um, on that service with MySQL. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think I thought you were asking, can you use MySQL to push the application onto the server? That would be a no, but you can on the, on the server, on like a server you spin up like this or the digital ocean, you can absolutely put your Spring Boot application along with your MySQL. Uh, you, can, you can install MySQL in there as well to get that set up. Um, definitely, uh, Tram Stars, like definitely take a look uh, next but this upcoming Sunday, again, will be a little bit early. We'll be at 12 instead of at eight, but we're gonna be doing a lot of that in the lab. We're gonna be setting up um, full systems there. I'm thinking of uh, using Docker to containerize a Discord bot, use AWS and Jubernetes. I'm assuming you make Kubernetes, but maybe Jubernetes is a cool thing to manage this bot and share the bot to be able to scale out rather than up. That's cool. Um, that is, that's cool. Uh, Kubernetes, the problem, so that's cool. The problem is Kubernetes on AWS is very expensive. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, unless you wanna set up Kubernetes yourself. Um, Kubernetes, setting up with Kubernetes yourself is ridic is is also not cheap, um, but you can probably do it for less money. Um, like I think just to get started with Kubernetes, it's like $150 a month, um, to be honest. Um, so uh, it's a good idea. It's definitely a good idea. Um, that sounds super, sounds super, yeah. AKS is like crazy expensive because you have to, they make you purchase uh, an entire, basically they have to give you a, a, a like a, like a, 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 lar a large server, like an M2 large or a T2 like large server or something like that to be able to run uh, the, the management, the control plan and everything. Uh, so like, like right off the bat, it's like a pretty expensive incurred cost. Um, what well, you can like that is if you leave it up. That's the that's the cost if you leave it up for the whole month. If you were just trying to like get it up and like test it out and use it for a day or two, like it would still cost you money. Uh, it wouldn't be that much, but uh, it would it wouldn't be free. Um, yeah, Kubernetes is 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 expensive to learn unless you're gonna do it locally um, with Minikube and some other stuff. I'll show you some other stuff, but pretty much all implementations of Kubernetes are kind of expensive right now to be 100% honest with you. Uh, Kubernetes itself doesn't cost money. Uh, the infrastructure to run Kubernetes costs money. Uh, and we're gonna get into Kubernetes heavily, but yes, the infrastructure to run Kubernetes does cost money. Do you keep your PIM files somewhere or just in downloads? I keep my PIM files uh, in a, um, in a, in a, just a folder that are in, that's in my documents. So CD um, the slash documents. Uh, what's it called? CD SS. I think it's AWS keys. So I just keep them all in a folder right here. Um, so uh, let's talk about what these are really quick. Um, so our server spun up right now. Uh, I downloaded this key right here, this SSH test key. I have a, a few other keys in here that I use for a couple other things. I actually have a lot more keys <laughs> somewhere else as well. Um, but uh, this .pem file, this is the key that um, that is generated for you to kind of authenticate with the server. Um, yeah, so we're gonna use this to be able to log in. What information do we need to log in over SSH? All you need to log in over SSH, um, or, or even FTP for that matter, is, um, is you need the IP address or the host name um, that you wanna use to connect to. Um, so to tell your network where to go, tell your computer where to go. Um, and then you need the username in which you want to, uh, log in as. So, uh, in here, um, in this terrible interface, we can go ahead and get our IP address. So there's a public IP here and a public DNS. I can use either one of these options. I'll use a shorter one just so, um, it'll make a little more sense and it's not gonna be all over the screen. So the way that you use SSH protocol, the way that you kick it off is to do SSH. Um, and that says, hey, go ahead and use SSH. And then usually it would be something like this. It would be SSH username. Uh, so whatever the username is, so it would be username. Whoa, M at, uh, so username at, uh, IP address. So this would be the normal breakdown. So uh, in our case, currently, let's let's fill in a username. Let's fill in an IP address. So 
This is one of the most annoying things about AWS. Uh, it's really dumb, and I don't know why they haven't, like, I don't know why they don't tell you this during the uh, creation process of a machine, but every distribution, um, not every, well, every distribution, every AMI, um, like, so the different machine images, uh, so Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat, Amazon Linux that you can choose from when you first spin up a virtual machine here uh, or server here, they have different users that they use to be able to log into the machine, but they don't tell you which one it is when you're setting up the server. Uh, this is information that you have to go find, which is so dumb. I really have never understood this. So by default, it doesn't create some special account for you and your username. It has a single account that you can use to log in and start to manage the system. So for Ubuntu, the user is actually Ubuntu. For other things, um, they, they're starting to standardize a bit for Amazon Linux and for Red Hat, I believe. Red Hat, I think, used to be root, uh, but I think now everything is EC2-user. So you might want to write that down, even though we're even, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the AWS portion. But tonight, the user is Ubuntu. So if you're like, how do you know the user is Ubuntu? Again, something you can Google. It's so dumb. It is like the dumbest thing ever. Um, it's so stupid. Uh, at the IP address. So, wait, is that the IP address? That seems wrong. That's the IP address. All right, so SSH user at IP address, and that is how you would use this protocol to log in. So normally, I would be able to hit this. Uh, first time you connect, it's, gonna, it's basically gonna add this fingerprint and say, hey, you've never connected here before. Are you sure you wanna connect? You will only have to ever answer this one time for the same system, and I'll type in yes, and it will fail to connect. Um, it will fail to connect because AWS by default does not allow password logins. Um, and the way that I set this up here, it's expecting a password. Um, great question, Adam. That Yes, I do. We're gonna do that in a second as well. Um, so uh, it at, like it said, hey, do you wanna connect? Um, I said, yep, go ahead and connect me. And then it says that uh, permission was denied public key. Um, so you could Google that and then it would probably tell you, hey, it looks like you need to use a key to authenticate. So let's go ahead and use a key to authenticate. So we have this here. The way that you use uh, an SSH key to, 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 pat, like to, to authenticate with a server is you simply, uh, you pass in a dash I, which is stands is short for uh, identity file, I believe, or identity or identity file. And so you give it your identity file, which is uh, your which is your PEM file that that kind of confirms your identity. Um, and so SSH test. So you do SSH dash I, which allows you to tell the computer uh, what your identity file is, which is this PEM file that we want to use. And then the rest of the command is the same. Our user at this IP address. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter here. And we get different output this time. You can also see it didn't ask me about this fingerprint thing because the fingerprint is already saved uh, locally. Um, I'll show you more about the fingerprint stuff uh, next class. Um, but it says warning, unprotected private key file. Now it looks crazy. You get all these at symbols and there's a big banner message. And let's read, let's read the error really quick. Permissions. 0644, you know what those numbers mean. You've learned what they are. Maybe you, maybe you don't know immediately uh, what they translate to, but you you know what numbers like that uh, refer to, especially when it says permissions right here. Uh, permission 0644 for SSH, SSH test.pim are too open. It is required that your private key files are not accessible by others. Um, this private key will be ignored. So SSH is for security. So uh, that means that they do not, they will not allow you to use a key, uh, which is which has permissions that are too open, which are open uh, for anyone else to use besides yourself. So to be able to use this properly, you gotta go ahead and you have to change the permissions. Um, and it says right here, uh, make sure it's not accessible by others. So uh, commonly, um, I change mine to usually uh, 0400, so that'll basically just give my user read access only. Uh, you can do whatever, you can do 0600, but it's important that no one else indicated by these two zeros here has access to this file, just my user here, and then specify the key here, uh, so SSH. All right, so now we can look at the permissions of this file and you can see here, 
Only I have read and write permissions and no one else has any other permissions here. So let's go ahead and let's rerun our command to log in. We do that and you can see here, uh, it took a second, but it goes through and it gives us some output. So it says, welcome to Ubuntu 18.04. Um, so we are actually in our server. Um, it gives you, this is basically a welcome message. Um, you can set up these things called message of the days, uh, and you can get stuff like this. Um, you can get some output when someone logs into a server. So we are actually now in a completely different computer. Uh, we are, we are SSH into our server. Um, how can you confirm this one again, this output will kind of let you know. Um, but also what it'll do is your prompt should change. So you can see up here. Um, it was my name at pop OS, which is the host name for my computer. Uh, and again, this right here is very reminiscent of what we did with the SSH command, which is username at host name, basically our IP address. Again, pop OS is just a DNS address for my, uh, for, for local hosts actually right now. So, um, this changed to Ubuntu at this host name. So we are actually in, uh, logged into our server, which is great. Um, super nice. Um, I'm going to do sudo apt. Actually, I don't need to do that because now you've seen me do, um, you see me do that now. Um, you should really my zero four zero zero. Yeah. I, I, I almost always, uh, no, I always go zero four zero zero. Um, uh, but yeah. Hey, retro renegade. Thank you for the follow. Welcome. Hey, retro renegade. Thank you for the sub. Welcome to the family. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate the support. Um, yeah, actually, also anyone who uh, I just say that every time we subscribe, uh, Retro Renegade, head over to the Discord um, whenever you get a chance. There's a link um, in there. Is a in, the Discord is subscriber is subscription only. Uh, in there, uh, in the general channel, is a pinned message uh, that has access to a Google Classroom, which has more information, has uh, more walkthroughs and resources about the things that we work on uh, during the streams. So you can check that out. But I'm in, I'm in the system now, which is great. Um, so that was me using SSH to log in. So um, to exit out of a server, um, if you're ever trying to get out of uh, a server or, or something, uh, you can type in exit. That's one way to log out. Um, I'll log back in. So just that easy, I'm back in. Uh, you can also do a control D to log out. So now I'm back out and I'll go ahead and log back in. So I'm in this server. I can do whatever I want. So I can do a, an LS here. I can see what's in this in this directory by default. I can see where I am. I can say, who am I? Who do you guys think I am right now? I am the Ubuntu user. Remember, that's who we logged in as. So we were able to get in as the Ubuntu user. Um, and let's see, uh, PWD, let's see where we are. And we're in the home Ubuntu fi uh, um, directory. Cool, so that is SSH. Um, let's go ahead and now use the, the SCP uh, command to get some files onto our server. We could use FTP, um, but I'm pretty sure. Um, actually, let me show you something. Let's log back in. Um, netstat dash dash two pin. Um, so uh, the command that I just ran, I just ran this net stack command and I do like to give this to people. There are better ones. You guys gave me some good ones, uh, good flags. Let me share this here. Um, this is a good way to see what, um, what protocols are open, uh, are open on your computer currently. Um, so uh, right now, uh, 53, port 53 is bind. And again, we learned from, uh, we learned that you can check your Etsy services to see what ports, uh, common port numbers are. But this is for a DNS here. Um, so is this. Uh, um, but that's, you know, we learned about what DNS was earlier. But the only other thing that we see, ignore the 68 for now, but the only other thing that we see is 22. And um, port 22 uh, is what? We just learned that port 22 is SSH. So these are really the only things that are running right now. Um, <laughs> You can see here that FTP is not actually, uh, there's no 20 or 21 here. We would actually need to install an FTP server on here, which again, we, we can do. Um, we can do it. We can do it in a second. Um, yeah, let's do that in a second. 
Uh, but first, let's use SSH to get some files on board. And this is, again, why I prefer why I personally prefer SSH, because, <laughs> you know, if you can log into it, that you can transfer files to it and it's fast um, and it's secure. Um, so we're going to go back to my we're going to get out of the server and go back to my host machine. Go ahead and do a D there. Um, let's actually let's do this. Um, FileZilla deb file so let's do this this will be exciting we can use this to um to install um filezilla filezilla server dev we're going to download the package for filezilla i actually can't even remember the last time i uh installed a cert a server, um, uh, a FTP server. So cool. This client is this the client, or is this maybe? Maybe I've actually never done. I've actually can't remember last time I did this. So we'll see what the install is like. We'll check that out in a second. But we're gonna go ahead and use SCP now to get this installer. I could have just you know used wget or something to download it directly to the server. But maybe we, maybe we, maybe it's our application. Maybe we created our own installer in house, and we need to get this up to the uh, up to the server. Um, I just downloaded this FileZilla common dev file here. Um, and I want to get it up to my server. So again, confirmed we are on my local machine now. Um, so now we can use uh, the same SSH command or uh, we can modify it to use the SCP protocol. So SCP, uh, so you just type, you just change SSH to SCP. Other than that, the setup is the same. Um, so the setup is still uh, like this, you still need to pass in your key. If you have to use keys to authenticate, um, you still need your username and you need your password. Um, but what you do here now is you uh, need to give it what file you want copied or file or files that you want copied up to your server. So the first file, the file that we want is this FileZilla dev file. So this is the same way, this is the same order as the copy command. So the copy command in Linux is copy, uh, file or source source file into the destination. So that's the order copy the file you want to copy and the destination you want to copy it to. This is uh, very similar. So we're going to do SCP. Um, and again, it, like you got to put this, uh, this thing here. So it knows what to do. And so this is the source file that we want to copy and to do the destination. The destination is this server. We know the destination is this remote location here. Uh, but to tell it where to put it on the server, we just do a col we do a, a colon there, and then we type in a file path to where we want it to go. So uh, the user's directory was home slash uh, Ubuntu. That's the directory we were in, so we can do that. But or uh, you can use the shortcut for home directory, which is uh, a tilde. And so um, so that is the full command there. So we get, this is our source file that we want to copy to this server and at this location, colon, uh, tilde. So let's hit enter. And we get some output here. We can see it uploaded 100%. It let us know how fast it transferred, but it's all done. It it, it went right back and it is it should be there. So let's go ahead and log back into this server. Now we're logged into our server. We get our little bit of output. We get our message of the day. Um, again, we can type in who am I? And you know that I'm Ubuntu. But if you do an LS here, we can see that this file is now on this remote machine. It's it's no like it is still on our local computer, but it is now on our remote machine. Oh, cool. Why don't I take a quick detour and show the .ssh config hmm, and have it just use the ID? Ah, oh, yeah, we can definitely do an SSH. I like that. We, we'll, we'll do that. Um, since you authenticated with SSH already, you don't have to again with SCP. Um, so yes, I do have to again with SCP. Um, so let's take a look at back at our SCP command. We are not using um, we are not using passwords to authenticate. We are using this SSH uh, key to authenticate. So we are still passing in that SSH key to authenticate. Um, yes, we can still do that. So, uh, yes, a, a blast seven. Thank you. That is a great detour, actually. Um, so what you also can do, you can see how the, building this command, it can be can be daunting. And if you if you're if you're consistently um, if you are consistently copying things to these servers, you're consistently messing around with the same servers, uh, you can make life 
much easier on yourself uh, by creating um, a host file. I mean, uh, um, a config file, SH config. Um, oh, I'm typing on the wrong, wrong thing. So uh, what you can do is you can set up this configuration file um, and you can um, you can you can set it up in a way that you can define a host that you want to connect to. You can define, you know, the IP address for it. You can define the identity file that you want to use when you're SSHing into it. Um, all that stuff. You can, you can identify the user, uh, the default user that you want to use when logging in. And then you no longer need to do uh, generate that whole command. So let's take a look here. I think this is, um, uh, I'll share this with you all because I, this is really good. You should use, um, you should use these when you can. So if you if you were to spin up your own server that you want to keep around, uh, you have a digital ocean server or something that you just want to keep around for your own uh, stuff. You're going to keep it up and it's going to stay the same. Uh, you can do something like this. So let's um, let's take a look at this config file. I really like that you brought this up. This is a good thing. Uh, so let's clear um, them. Uh, all the SSH stuff by default lives in a folder, uh, which is your home file, your home folder slash dot SSH. What does the dot sig uh, signify? Think back on it. A dot signifies that it is a hidden uh, directory. Um, and so in here, uh, there are a few files uh, in here. So this IDRSA is a um, is an, is a private key. Um, a private SSH key uh, that I use for GitHub actually. Um, but uh, in here, you can see that there's this config file in here. So uh, you can do a lot of stuff with config files in Linux. Uh, most of Linux is just a giant config file. Um, but let's take a look at this, at this config file. So you can see here, I have some stuff already set up in here. Um, so why do I have these things set up here? I have these things set up because um, I, I, with a with my personal GitHub, not my mastermind GitHub. I need to set up my mastermind GitHub properly. Um, but I I I yeah, I, I'll fix that soon. Um, I set up these SSH uh, um, config settings so that I could uh, easily again authenticate with these without having to type in a bunch of stuff. So let's go ahead and let's copy one of these blocks, and we'll go down and we'll yank it, and we will. Oh, whoops. Um, and let's give it a host. So the host is going to be, let's call it, uh, let's call it stream SSH. So again, this host name is just kind of a DNS name that we're going to use to refer to, uh, to, to this connection, basically this SSH connection that the server that we want to connect to, we're going to refer to it as, as stream SSH. <coughs> what is. Oh uh, no, that was gross. I forgot I, I forgot I flicked off the top and put it in the drink, but there was still stuff left. That was disgusting. Um, but the host name, the host name is gonna be the IP address or the DNS address of where this connection should go to. So let's go ahead and go back in AWS and let's grab that. Um, actually, we don't even need to go there. Let's take a look back at um, the commands that we ran. Ah, that's, that's not gonna work. Um, yeah, let's go back in AWS. I thought it would maybe give you a little more context if I pulled it from the same place. But the host name, uh, the host name is going to be either this or this. Uh, so we're going to just take the IP address here. We're going to copy this and we're going to place this right here. The host name is going to be this IP address. Now the user, again, the default user you want to use is Ubuntu. And then we need to tell it the location of our identity file. So, um, I think the location of mine is in AWS, is in home documents, AWS keys. And what is this one called? SSH test. All right, so this is all the information that we just use to log into the server. But this way we've given, we have basically given like a profile. We basically have a profile here. I mean, it has all the information that we need to connect to the server that we just used. So it has the IP address, it's got the user and it's got the identity file that we need to authenticate. So now all I can do, all I need to do is to get in instead of running, instead of running this long command here, 
or, or, or the SSH command to get in there, um, I can simply do SSH stream SSH, because that's what I called it. I called it stream SSH, and I hit that, and just like that, we were able to log in. So I can also do the same thing with, uh, let's uh, make, let's uh, touch, that was Vim, uh, welcome.txt, and I can type in a bunch of words, hello, welcome to our server. Whoa. What happened? All right, there we go. Welcome to our server. So now we have this new welcome.txt file. I can still use the same thing. Um, I can say SCP. I don't need to. I don't need to specify all that new information. Um, I can say uh, SCP welcome.txt. So this is, now this is really like the. This is much more like the copy command that you know already. SCP welcome.txt. We want to copy it to our remote server. So we want to copy it to stream. SSH, because that's what I called it. You can call it whatever you want. And I want to copy that to the home directory there. So I will do this. And let's go ahead and run that. Um, couldn't resolve hostname stream. Is that not what I called it? What did I call it? Where's the last command? Uh, cat. Uh, slash. Uh, what's this config? What's happening? What's happening? SSH. Oh, I'm already, that was dumb. That was stupid. I'm dumb. You guys, that was dumb. Thank you. I'm already in the server. I'm on the server already. Uh, so I just tried to, I created this file here, which was dumb. Um, actually, so I could copy it back, but I'm not going to. I'm going to remove that file. Uh, I was actually on the server itself, which is, uh, a little embarrassing, just a little bit. Uh, so let's get off of this server. So again, that didn't work because that SSH config is set up locally on my computer and I was in the server trying to reference the same SSH config, um, which was, that's why I also couldn't see the commands that I had already run um, in here. So um, so we can change this to SCP. Let's make our file really quick. Bim welcome dot TXT. Uh, Welcome to our server. Oh. Uh, all right, so now we can just do SCP welcome.txt, so the source file, and the destination is stream, uh, what is it, stream SSH, and the location is tilde. So a lot shorter than the last SCP command we ran. And it goes ahead and it copies that up, which is super great. And now to get into the server, we can just do SSH stream SSH and we can now log into our server. Nice. And let's see if it, if it got copied up properly. It looks like it did, but now we can see welcome.txt here. So, uh, yes, the config, the config file is great. The SSH config is great. Again, um, I posted the link there for you to kind of reference uh, how it works. There should be a good explanation there of kind of how it works, but the setup is pretty simple. Uh, the setup is, um, I think, uh, it, it's funny because I, I used to always have to look up the, um, I used to always have to look up like the, the setup. Um, but yeah, pretty simple thing. And again, I can call this host whatever I'd like. This this is basically a variable. Call it whatever you like, whatever's easy for you to type. That's what you should call it. And you can set up all your stuff here. And there we go. It's a big variable. Okay. So let's actually log back into the server. Let's see if we can get let's see if we can get SS, uh, FTP set up. I I don't even know if it's gonna work, but we're gonna find out. Uh, so what is here? Uh, let's go ahead and install this FileZilla common. I don't know if this is the client or the server. Um, yeah, I mean, I could probably just install it from the package manager, but uh, actually, mm, let's go ahead and see if this works. Uh, so to install, um, I could actually probably do this with app, but I know how to do it with dbkg. Um, so I'm gonna use a package manager to install this deb file. I'm gonna do sudo dbkg-i for install, and I'm gonna specify this file. And it's gonna go ahead and it's gonna start running. It's gonna extract it. Um, and this is all going to be uh, installing here. 
files. They're in the server. Yep. O three O six is that UTC where on the top? Um, is it UTC? Let's see. Uh, yeah, it is UTC. Uh, why is this taking so long? Oh, maybe I, maybe I need to do an update or something beforehand. All right, so it looks like it installed um, a service. Um, man, old school. Let me see what this is. I don't know what the executable is for this. Let's see. And it, maybe I maybe I can see it this way. There are better ways to do this, um, but um, how do you start? Oh, oh, okay. Hold on. Let's see. Uh, unit service not found. Um, why is all terminal and no UI? Oh, um, so, um, yeah. So basically, uh, you can use the, <laughs> The, the terminal, everything you can do from the graphical user interface, you can do from the terminal. Um, everything you're doing on the graphical user interface is essentially um, passing commands, uh, these same commands to the server. Um, the, the reason why uh, Linux servers uh, generally do not have a graphical user interface installed on them is because um, is because graphical user interfaces cause a bit of overhead um, and that, oh, and again, you want to be able to get the most out of your server. Don't really need it because again, you're generally just uh, managing applications and services, and you can do all that just fine via the uh, via the via here. Um, and it's also much quicker to manage a system um, via the command line. It, it really is. Um, yeah, it really it it really is. Um, it's not running. So I actually don't know. Latency and yeah, latency X11 absolutely makes it worse. X11 is the uh, is the kind of window driver uh, for for that. Um, for, yeah, for a GUI. Um, so or display driver failed to start. I actually, have, we're gonna we're gonna just look for a tutorial because I actually have no idea how to use FileZilla. So let's let's just Google. Let's let's do what we would we would normally do. Install a FileZilla server Ubuntu. Very simple. Let's see. We're probably missing something here. Uh, let's pick something that's a little bit newer if we can. All right. Um, these people are telling me how to install it, but I think we've already got it installed. Um, let's take one of these old ones. Maybe it'll still be relevant. Make it a little bit bigger. It talks about what FTP is. Again, this is like those, uh, like I said, like those recipes. I don't care. I just want to know what to do. Um, so this is using VS FTP. Maybe we should just do that um, because maybe that's a better server. Let's do that. Let's go ahead and follow. Let's go ahead and follow this whole uh, thing here. I like this. Um, yeah, nice. We're gonna have some fun. So sudo app update. So the first thing I need to do is I need to, you know, uh, update all my mirrors, update all my all the places um, uh, streams I can get. Um, Packages from get get information about updates and things like that. I'm not about to do an upgrade. I'm just going to do an update so I can grab this stuff. So I'm basically copying and pasting commands on this. If you ever want to follow along, this, this is old. This may not work. <laughs> super slam code. Is are you talking about like a Denny Super Slam? Is that is, is that what it's called? Oh, that's Grand Slam. What's Super Slam? Oh, is that uh with that on here? What, what is this? What does this add for? Get out of here. All right, cool. Um, oh, that was an ad. Well, yeah, it comes with pancakes, no waffles. I like that. I like that. See, see, people, they, they, they know what's important. Whoever's making a super slam, they know what's important. All right, so I did my app update. Uh, they want you to install Vim if you don't already have Vim so that you can do some modifications once you get it installed. We're gonna go ahead and install this VS uh, FTPD program. Uh, I remember. I think I remember VS FTP. I'm pretty sure this is a common FTP server for Linux. Um, so it's asking me if I wanna install it. So let me know what changes it's gonna make. 
let's go ahead and do that. Now, if you're doing this through, um, through if you're trying to follow along and you're using Amazon, uh, just note that if you can't connect, uh, it's probably because we did some stuff earlier. I, I did some stuff earlier to enable um, uh, secure, my security groups to work properly um, with this, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. I can tell you that in a second uh, as we're running through this tram stars, I can definitely tell you what the normal day for me is like. So we got this installed. Um, so now we, it looks like we need to configure this. Um, so we need to we need to vim this file. So Etsy vs ftpd.conf. So let's go ahead and modify that file. So um, vs uh, sudo vim Etsy. Uh, so daily basis. Um, when I was just when I wasn't the, the the team lead and I was just doing DevOps, um, the, the daily I guess the daily job um, is generally uh, in a lot of places and again it differs. There's definitely um, there's a sliding scale of like so some jobs are more ops related, some jobs are more dev related, but um, uh, there there'd be a bit there'd be a, a fair amount of infrastructure maintenance. So. Um, uh, checking on, um, you know, well, we put, a, we put a lot of automation around this. Um, so a, it, it, most of the job is creating automation is, Hey, how do we, um, how do we make sure that weekly our, um, our machine images have, uh, the latest security updates. And so it would be, you know, we may spend the week building out, um, building out a, a packer job, uh, to be able to automatically, um, uh, apply those updates and give us a new image that gets automatically deployed on Monday. And our job may be uh, assisting the developers. Um, the developers may have a new feature, uh, which requires a new piece of infrastructure. So maybe uh, maybe our developers now are gonna use, um, they're gonna be using a, a cloud search domain. They're gonna be using a new search domain. So now they need an, oh, an entirely new uh, AWS uh, service to use and it may be assisting helping you know get set up there giving the right permissions uh getting those things set up um responding to production issues maybe if there's issues with latency there's issues with the site uh with, with the production website or getting code uh deployed to the website um is also things that you might be doing but again it's uh, the daily job is for for a lot of people is just assisting where needed in the software development life cycle. So just really helping developers get their code from their computer uh, into uh, into production or the place where people can consume it. Um, so yeah, a lot of a lot of systems management. Uh, a lot of times, if you're working with the cloud, you'd be doing tons of AWS stuff. Again, a lot of DevOps jobs are basically infrastructure um, administrators. Uh, honestly, um, so you'd be doing a lot of stuff inside of the AWS uh, from the command line, logging in the servers, uh, or using a tool like Terraform to manage your servers through code, or managing servers instead of manually through tools like Puppet or Chef. Um, and so it's basically writing configuration to install stuff. So instead of actually installing this, um, this VSFTP server by hand, um, we would be able to, to declare it in something like puppet or chef and it would get, get that installed, uh, for us for sure. Um, but yeah, uh, like again, there's, there's definitely a range of DevOps engineers, uh, like from my experience, a vast, like a, a, a vast majority of the jobs uh, lean more towards ops, the ops side of things. Uh, again, like systems administrator type things, the server management aspects of it. Um, but uh, there are a ton that now, that now, um, like basically you're you're one of the developers who also knows how to manage the infrastructure. So, yeah, it can get it can get uh, it can get complicated. But for me, day to day, for me, day to day, um, I'm I'm usually working on uh, either code for the application um, or troubleshooting issues with um, infrastructure and pipelines for production, like code getting out to production builds and things like that um, is usually what I'm doing. All right, back to here. So they want me to edit. The, they want me to edit this co configuration file, but they don't tell me what what they want to do. Let's change some parameters to make it act like a real FTP server. So we're going to change Anonymous enabled to no. So, all right, I'll do that first. Um, let's look for a non, there we go. 
Wait, that looks right. Disable by default. So maybe I don't need to do that. Oh, by changing the value to yes, you can enable us and not. Okay, sure. I will. I will change it to yes because they have asked me to change it to yes, and the server is going to go away. So that's the first thing we're going to do. And then uncomment, write enable, yes. So uh, write enable. So let's look for uh, write. Um, oops. Oops. Uh, we'll uncomment this. So write enable, yes. Uh, they want us to do that. Uncomment line x for log file. All right, so it looks like it's gonna give us logs. So <clears throat> x for okay, that's already enabled. <clears throat> oh no no no, the file x for log. Next option here. All right, so x for log file. Um, and so. Uh, you may override where the log file goes. So this is going to tell us where the log file goes. We've done some cool stuff. Um, uncomment FTDP banner and place your own welcome text. Okay. Uh, so let's look for slash banner. Slash banner. Um, All right, welcome to live to be service. Welcome to mastermind FTP service. All right. And then exit looks like it wants to save an exit. So we'll save an exit. All right, that's saved. And let's go ahead and restart the service. And a restart, even though the service is probably not running, the restart did that. All right, so now if we do a net stat, um, look at this, look at what we have now. Uh, we did a net stat before to see what ports were running. We have uh, 21 and 22, I mean 21 here, uh, which is the FTP port. Uh, don't, I don't see 20, but I see 21 here. Um, so cool. So it looks like we have a server running. Um, yeah, it looks like we have a server running. So let's do this. Um, oh, so it looks like we can, uh, they use Telnet to, um, to make a local connection to 21 and see if we can get, uh, the, the expected result back. They spelled tel Telnet wrong. Um, and cool. So using Telnet to, uh, connect via the, the the protocol that we were talking about over 421. Uh, you can see here the response we get is a welcome to Mastermind FTP service. So we can confirm that our FTP service is up um, and likely working properly. Um, so unfortunately though, you need to log in with a username and a password. So here's what we're gonna do. How do I get out of this? Oh wait, I don't remember, wait. Oh yeah, it's, it's control, there we go, Q. There we go. All right, tell that can be tough to get out of. Um, hey, Boort, Boort, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Um, I don't think I gave uh, Retro Renegade uh, welcome to the family. Thank you for the subscription, uh, for sure. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, I can use I can use uh, user anonymous. I forgot we just enabled anonymous users. So uh, locally, um, I can use. Um, you can FTP from the command line. You can. Uh, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's their right fault yet. So you can use FTP from the command line. Um, I'm going to install FileZilla. I, I, I really am. Um, it feels weird, but, um, I just want to show you, we, we've done SSH. Uh, I do want to show you, I want to show you this. Oh, it's FileZilla. Oh, BZ, I'm going to have to install this from, let me just see. Let me just see something really quick. I'll give you guys a, uh, let's see if it's in the pop OS store. Yeah, I mean, real, li real lazy. See, Linux is kind of cool. It's cool sometimes. You guys have a little store here and cool things like this um, I can use. 
it's going gonna, it's gonna to go ahead and it's going to install the FileZilla client for me, which is really nice because I'm getting real lazy. And is it installed? Okay. All right. So uh, generally, most people use uh, FileZilla in this manner, uh, in the GUI manner, because you can log in and you can traverse uh, it visually the directories. Um, so let's go ahead and let's grab the IP address that we have here. Cat uh, slash Etsy uh, slash dot SSH uh, config. Oh, that still worked. Oh yeah, that still worked. Uh, so let's grab this really quick. So this is the IP address that we're gonna go to. And I'm assuming because you just said that I can log in as anonymous. Um, again, I haven't done this in a long time. So username, let's go. Do I even have to type in anything? Anonymous. And the password is gonna be whatever. And it should default to 21, but I'll put in 21 there. And I'll go to quick connect. Don't say passwords. This server does not support FTP over TLS. If you continue, your password and files will be sent over. Okay. So, uh, did that work? Sent passive unrootable address using server address instead. It's not connected, so that did not work. It looks like it's still try connection failed, um, did not work. Um, so is that how you connect via anonymous user? Uh, am I gonna have to create an actual user? Am, or, or am I trying to, why is it trying to do it over TLS? Well, it's not, it's not. Anonymous at, do I have to, do I actually have to put in a password? Logged in. Retrieving, oh, because it, it okay, so maybe I need uh, password equals your email address. Try active instead of passive. Password equals your email address for anonymous. Was my email address? Why would it equal my email address? I don't understand. Um, so, so the server that we installed, uh, we, we, we installed v, VSFTP or v, VSFTP. Uh, okay, um, so the password is any email address. Um, all right, so, um, test at, uh, gmail.com. Server does not support non ASCII characters. That what, what, what non ASCII characters? What am I typing in here? Let me close all these. Close. <laughs> it just, yeah, it says it's logged in. It's filling the list. Um, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm just gonna create a user just because we, cause that's some Linux stuff that we learned. Um, so I'm gonna user, I'm gonna sudo user add um, dash M. So it creates me a directory of, uh, of FTP user. Um, so if we LL slash home, we have FTP user. Let's also um, change the password. Um, I'm not telling you what the password is. Y'all gonna try to upload crazy stuff to my server. Um, let's make it something secure, the most secure. Even though it only has eight characters. Um, let's see. Director for anonymous FTP user. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, we just created a user. Uh, let's see if this works really quick. Um, anonymous, so instead we're gonna go FTP user. Password's going to be my sweet, secure password. That's so secure. 
establish new connection. Ah, yeah, it can't it can't retrieve directory listing. I wonder why. I wonder why it can't retrieve directory listing. Maybe it is a. It seems like it wouldn't. Nothing in there. What is Yakachona or something? PWG. What is that? What is PWGen? Let's check that out. See, this is why FTP is stupid. No, it's not stupid. FTP is, is fine. Uh, but this is one of the reasons, like, I don't like dealing with stuff like this. Because uh, I'm lazy. Open source generator. Oh. Well, man, that, this, this is a lot of work. There's a FileZilla setting to use active mode. It has to do with the IP. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, is there, is there a setting here or is there a setting on the server? Uh, it's probably here. How do I delete? What's happening here? I think I broke it. I think I broke it. I'm going back into it. All right. So you think it's transfer server. Active mode. They're like a. There's so many options here. I wonder if it'll work via the command line. Hold on. Let me let, let's see if it works via the command line real quick. <laughs> FTP command line. Actually, let me do it here. <clears throat> FTP command line. Let's see if it connects that way and not over that. I just want to see. Is it just open? Really? Can't be. <laughs> hmm, do I need to set up a... Huh. Okay. Interesting. Let's do... I haven't done this in a long time either. FTP as the password. Here we go. We got a sweet password right here. Um, anonymous. I spell anonymous. Oh, it's okay. So login successful. Can't do a directory listing. Um, that makes sense. So I'm logged in. And how do I select my, oh, I can do an LS here. I can do an LS. Whoa. I cannot. That means someone, somebody's already, somebody, uh, legal port command. Oh man. Yeah. If you have the coronavirus, uh, no one's, no one's helping you. Just stay, don't, don't, don't put it in chat, please. Um, did you eat the raw steak to get it? Um, let's see here. Let's try our user. Let's try our user instead of, um, that anonymous user. Hmm, I have to be buying our, this is interesting. 500, blue point command. I, I, I don't know what's happening here. Let's Google it. I wonder if there's more I need to, um, to do. I wonder if this is purely a, um, an AWS like networking problem. <laughs> that is a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow these. I shouldn't allow these, but I'm gonna. No, oh, he did it anyway. Never mind. You got it. You got it. You got it through. Very clever. Very clever. Is yes. Yeah, port twenty one open on the port rules. Yes, it is. So I'm logging in. I'm, I'm logging in successfully. Uh, if and you can see here in the where is the um, security group? 
In the security group, I am doing inbound uh, 20, 21 and 20 from any IP address. So it's there and it is successfully, I'm successfully logging in. Um, so that's a login. I just can't do anything else. Um, not sweating it. Uh, maybe it has to do with this VSFTP. Maybe we can troubleshoot it a bit. Let's let, let's troubleshoot just a little bit. And if not, we'll get off in a few minutes. Uh, VS FTP, um, unable to list directory. All right, let's see what we got here. Whoa, way too large. All right, not gonna read this person's problem because I only want the answer. Higher ports in the same WA. Uh, this sounds whack. I just wanted a quick answer. I wanted them to tell me to change one thing. I'll go back to this in a second if I don't get the answer on the next one. This is from 2011. Let's get this one from 2017. Your port forwarding is wrong. You should not. Okay. So maybe, man, why are you whack? Passive mode enabled. Maybe that's the problem. Same exact issue typically affects G GUI FTP clients. Passive mode, pretty common. All right. Here we go. We're going we're gonna to just do this. We're going to just do it. We're not afraid. This server is ephemeral. We're going to just do this also add one of the following chunks to your vsftp file based on your situation uh i'm gonna leave that off for now i'm just gonna paste this stuff in here we're going rambo and we are gonna get this right now let's go ahead and ssh uh stream ssh whoa oh wait i'm already on the server wait you guys are setting me up again why are you setting me up? You're setting me up. I was doing all this from the server. I think that's the problem. Right? Maybe that's why I couldn't direct. Uh, that's why the address is already in use. Oh, whoops, man. I need to change my, I need to change my bash uh, profile to be different when I'm in a different system. Uh, maybe, um, um, password login successful. There we go. All right. There we go. Directory sent. Okay. All right. So this is working now. Let me actually get out of this for a second. Um, so now you can see, uh, actually this is a great time to say that like you'll be working through a problem. Uh, uh, and it'll be dumb like that for a long time. Uh, and it's good to get another set of eyes on there. Um, like, I, I don't know. That's like, this is something that happens day to day. Um, and until you see it, you may not, you may feel really bad about it. But as you can see, I've been in the industry for a while. And I, again, I get confused. I do stuff like that. Uh, just human errors. This is why we do DevOps. This is why we try to automate things because humans do dumb things like that. Um, cool. So let's do an LS here. Uh, directory listing. This is the home. Okay. So now how do we copy something? How can, oh, we have to put it to it to put the file. No, no, no. This is the wrong one. This is the right one. Where are Linux FTP? Command line. All right, let's see how we upload. File. So I'm in. I did the directory listing. I got what they said. Okay to send. CD directory. All right. Um, even though I can't see anything, it didn't give me a directory list. Um, maybe I need to make a directory first. I'm in the home directory. There's nothing in here because there's nothing actually there's nothing in here. Um, so I don't need a CD into directory, but how do I put files there? Downloading files. LCD. Oh, this looks complicated before downloading a file. We should set the local FTP file download directory by using LCD. Okay. Uh, local directory 
get file file we downloaded to the directory okay but uploading files let's put oh we'll put a file all right so i don't know what's here uh there's just some aws keys here actually let's get back in there and we're gonna put uh one of these pim files up there so ftp user sweet super secure password that i did not type in properly because it's so secure uh so secure and there's so many letters that I don't even could even type it in. All right, uh, so it looks like we can just do a put um, in one of the files. Let's do abrooks.pim, abrooks.pim. Oh, it looks like it did it. So let's uh, let's go over here. Let's log in, SSH uh, stream, uh, SSH. All right, and let's go into uh, slash home. Uh, FTP user and we look in here and look at that we were able to use FTP to transfer a file even though it took us way too long even though we weren't able to do it through um, through FileZilla let me see if I can get it now maybe it'll work now username I don't know why it would work now um, but let's just try it out anyway Oh, always allow insecure. Oh, never. No, no, no. All right. Yeah, still doesn't work uh, through the GUI. I'm sure there's something. There's, I'm sure there's a setting in here that make it work. But again, you can see FTP is another protocol to do this. Um, and we were able to use FTP to do to do that. We were able to put a file. It transferred that file, and we were able to get it on our server. So that was uh, that was fun. That was fun. We messed around with a bunch of different things tonight. Um, hopefully, you got a lot out of that. Uh, hopefully, you learned about what did we learn about networking and security, um, and protocols, and we learned about the OSI model. Uh, take a look at that. We learned about DNS. DNS is super important. Um, take some time to learn how DNS uh, works. Make sure you understand DNS. Check out some of the other records. There are SOA records. There are a bunch of other records uh, in terms of DNS and the managing DNS. DNS can get super tough. Um, DNS security, DNS sec is a big thing uh, nowadays as well. So maybe just something to learn about, something that would be cool to talk about during an interview. And we learned some Linux commands, new, some new commands to add to our tool belt to help us interact with DNS. Um, we learned about HTTP and HTTPS, uh, that HTTPS is secure is generally what sites are going to be using most. Like, I don't even think you're, I don't even think, uh, if you're using like Chrome, I don't think it'll allow you to go to a HTTP site. I don't like, I think it'll like, it'll give you a big error or something. And maybe you, maybe you can get there, but, uh, we learned about those. Remember, uh, HTTP is over port 80. HTTPS is over, uh, four, four, three, four, 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 three. Uh, learned about SSL and TLS certificates. Uh, FTP to transfer files, which we did uh, just now for 2021 and SCP and SSH. SSH allows you to log into servers. SCP allows you to transfer files to servers using uh, SSH protocols. So yes, a lot of stuff. Um, can you repeat when is making SQL upload? Oh, uh, Sunday. Uh, we won't be we won't be doing exactly that, but we will be installing, you know, like a, a database, uh, MySQL. Um, instance and I guess there will be a web app on there um, as well. I will be using we'll be installing like a web server to be able to serve these files out. So that will be Sunday. That will be at noon again. Remember uh, for the DevOps course because of the Super Bowl, we're going to stream at noon. You'll be able to watch it. Um, you'll be able to watch it whenever you'd like. Um, it should be available if you want to watch it at the same time. If you if you don't care about the Super Bowl, or you're not in. <laughs> you don't. Yeah, you don't care about football, or you're not in the U.S. and Soccer is your thing or football. The real football is your thing. Um, yeah, uh, you can watch it whenever you want. It'll be there and it'll be available. But uh, we will do that early noon Eastern time um, on Sunday. I'm from Europe, so I have to plan. It's f it's 441 night at the moment. Wow. Uh, well, I, I appreciate your I appreciate your um, your drive there. I appreciate your dedication. Uh, these do go up on YouTube as well. So if you need to, I don't want to keep you from sleeping. Um, they go up on YouTube as well um, in a playlist. So uh, I have to wait 24 hours because of, of Twitch's terms of service. Um, but yep, they go up on YouTube afterwards. 
uh, RDS. Um, so for the for the for the checkpoint lab that we're gonna do, we're not gonna use RDS because we haven't learned anything about the cloud yet. Um, we're gonna just kind of stick inside of some servers and and uh, just I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna only use the things that have uh, that we've learned so far. So yeah, we'll get into all that uh, right. I think right after the checkpoint lab is when we get into the cloud stuff, uh, which is exciting. Uh, yeah, right after the checkpoint lab. So we're just going to be doing work. The checkpoint lab is going to be using all everything we learned. So we'll probably even deploy a little go application as well. We'll write a little application. Um, yeah, I think that'll be cool. And then we'll hop into the cloud. That'll be fun. We'll get into the real like so to be 100% honest with you guys. Like this is base level stuff. Like this is the, the foundational stuff, learning a little bit of Linux, learning a little bit of networking, security, uh, super important, learning a little bit of programming concepts, super important. This is the meat and potatoes of what you would, someone asked about what to do, day, what, what you're generally doing day to day. Again, this isn't the same across the board for everyone, but a lot of DevOps jobs are like really doing management in the cloud and using infrastructure as code to do that management of the cloud um, and some container stuff. <laughs> So like this, these next coming weeks are going to be the like real meat and potatoes of like, of like the stuff that you'll probably be most hands on with and everything that we've learned so far enables you to do these, these things. But, um, yeah, we're getting there. We're definitely getting there, uh, for sure. So next time, oh, what's today? Is this, is this today Tuesday? Cool. So uh, this is it for the week. Um, yeah, so we're done. So next week, um, no, actually I'm lying to you all. What is today? I'm lying to you all. The, the checkpoint lab is next Wednesday. Um, the checkpoint lab is Wednesday. So, um, sorry about sorry about that, Tram Stars. Uh, that checkpoint lab is is Wednesday. It's, so it'll be at normal time. Um, web servers and traffic management will actually be on Sunday, on Super Bowl Sunday. So this will be earlier in the day. That makes me feel a little bit better. Actually, I would like. I would like people to be around live for the uh, for the lab. So this makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so we'll do this on Sunday and we will do this on Tuesday. Nice. All right. I get because I'm running two boot camps right now because I'm running the Python one. I always get uh, a little bit messed up on that count. Um, also, if you're in if you're in Python or interested in anything in the Python course, or you want to dive back into some programming, we are tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we are actually diving into algorithms for the first time. We just did our first algorithm last night. Uh, we've kind of learned just enough to really start doing algorithms, but we are going to do an introduction to algorithms tomorrow. I saw some algorithms uh, tomorrow in the Python bootcamp. So if that's something you're interested in, come on and check that out. Um, does anyone? Before we're out of here, does anyone have any questions tonight? I'm studying for uh, Network uh, Plus, so it's nice to see an example of some of those protocol commands. Yes, there will be. Uh, I'm glad Network Plus is is great. I'm I'm networking is my weakest. Uh, I think my weakest discipline, um, and I'm definitely trying to learn more. Um, we'll be doing when we get into the links. I, I mean, to the cloud part, we'll be using a lot of networking commands to make sure things are networked properly and connected properly as well. So you'll get some. Uh, that should also give you a few more of these commands as well. Um, but that's dope. Let, let me know how that goes. Um, do you have a date that you're planning on taking it? Um, so we can, uh, maybe we'll make a calendar. Maybe we'll make this shared calendar or something of, uh, of dates. People are planning on taking exams and stuff and certification courses just so we can like cheer each other on and check in and, and, you know, it ain't, ain't no big deal if you don't pass, but just like, just, you know, as people are, maybe we can do shout outs once a week, just like, Hey, this week, you're going to do great. Give you a little encouragement, help uh, help give you some support during that time. Um, awesome. End of February. That's, that's great. Uh, I also encourage anyone who's looking to get any type of certification um, to just schedule it. Like, like if you are finding that you are not studying, schedule it, schedule it, schedule it, and it'll make you move. Um, it That's helped me at least. Uh, like if I'm like just lollygagging on you know, studying for something or just moving slow, schedule it and the rest, uh, let the rest take care of itself. I'm shooting for the R the RHGSA, not, not an easy exam, but haven't scheduled an exam yet. That long bell, that's awesome. Um, I've considered going for it a few times, um, but I just, I don't know. I just, I, I just never did. Cool, you're in Discord now, awesome. I'm glad you are in Discord. I like that. I think we should, I, I do think we should create some kind of certification like 
the calendar or something. Awesome. Well, um, let's check out who to raid tonight. Um, who is available? Who's online? Let's see. I need to find my anyone have any recommendations on someone we should head over to uh, to end the week for uh, to end the week for DevOps. Let's see who's online. The prime again still on uh, Dow rights is still on. Went over to Isaiah Creative last night. Um, maybe let me see who else is in here. Absolutely, Retro Renegade. Um, absolutely. Uh, um, thanks for thanks for asking great questions. Thanks for hanging around for a while. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Let's head over to. Uh, actually, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send everyone over to the same guy last night. Um, just because he has he 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 seems cool. Um, and it's it's nice to. I feel like it'll make his day a little bit more um, than than the prime again. Like maybe, yeah. I think I think we'll do that. So let's raid. Um, but absolutely, thanks everyone um, for coming in and chilling tonight. Isaiah Create. All right, counting down. Uh, 10 seconds to go. Everyone have a great night. Thank you for uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, good luck this weekend in, in practicing your learning and everything. Um, I will see everyone on Super Bowl Sunday at noon. Don't forget noon, or I'll see you tomorrow in the DevOps course. Uh, I mean, in the Python course at the same time. Have a good night.